Good morning and welcome to the 18th meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee for 2024. Our first item of business this morning is consideration of the Circular Economy Scotland Bill at Stage 2, and this is Day 3 of that. I'd like to welcome Gillian Martin, the Minister for Climate Action and her supporting officials. I'd also like to welcome Graham Simpson, and I think other members may be present um, <clears throat> during the uh, stage, uh, during the meeting. Um, at last week's meeting, the committee ended consideration of the bill um, for the day, having disposed of amendments to section eight and agreeing that section. So we'll start off there. Can I just uh, say to members, um, uh, I don't want to curtail anyone's debate on any of the issues, but uh, uh, as always, the time is against us, but uh, it, this is democracy, um, and so it's important everyone has their say, but I'm just conscious of, of I am totally in your hands. I have no ability to control the length of the meeting. Uh, so having said that, I'm going to call Amendment 24 in the name of Graham Simpson, group with amendments 25, 26, 27, 29 and 35. Graham Simpson, can you speak to, uh, sorry, speak to and move Amendment 24 and move uh, and speak to any of other amendments? I'll get this right. I'm going to start that again. It's obviously way too early for me. Graham Simpson, can you move Amendment 24 and please speak to the other amendments in the group? Graham. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll move uh, Amendment 24 uh, convener. I um, have to say so far it's been quite a frustrating process, um, but hopefully it will get better um, as the, the morning goes on. Um, I always like to think at stage two that you know members can listen to actual debates and base their votes uh, on that, and indeed the minister uh, can be flexible and not have to adhere to what, what seemed to me to be quite an old speech, um, probably written before she took office. However, on, sec on uh, Amendment 24, um, it's not clear to me what this section would apply to, but some of the wording is concerning. I've got a number of amendments relating to charges for single items, but uh, this one would remove those charges under this legislation if there is ever a deposit risk return scheme. Now, the minister, who I accept was not the architect of the DRS shambles, may say that it's obvious that would be the case, but nothing is obvious unless you make it so, uh, and that's why we need something in legislation, hence Amendment 24. Amendment 25, um, the circular economy uh, to me is about ensuring that goods and products which can be recycled or reused are recycled and reused. We've, we have become a throwaway society, um, who, as anyone who's been on a litter pick will know. It's not clear to me, as I said earlier, what this section would cover, but during the stage one debate, I said that on charges for single-use items, um, this could be a container that you might get a takeaway meal in, a fish and chip tax. And the wording of the bill suggests that is the case. It says the regulations may only specify items which are A, manufactured, um, B, provided one as a container or packaging for goods, or two, to be used in connection with the consumption or use of goods, and C, likely to be used for that purpose only once or for a short period. So my fear could definitely come to fruition. All sorts of things could attract surcharges. Shoe boxes, bags that clothes come in, tins, the paper bags that your prescriptions come in. There are all kinds of things this could encompass. And of course, Scotland's great chippies could be hit by this. But what if the committee were to accept Amendment 25 at a stroke, items which are biodegradable, and that's what this amendment uh, is about, would be exempt. We're surely not targeting such items. After all, they'll rot away. Biodegradable food and drink containers would not face a charge. Why should they? Convener, the committee can do the right thing on this and spare our chippies. And on Amendment 26, given the woolly wording of the bill, I firmly believe that if we go down this road, then we should set out which single-use items are not covered. 
Now, the minister may say, <clears throat> we can't do that because it would be too long a list. But surely businesses need that sort of clarity. The minister could set out a list of the categories of products to be exempt, which would be a much shorter list than individual products. Maybe that's something we could look at for stage three. I know people are looking at stage three already. Businesses need clarity. And because this is a framework bill, they don't have that, and hence the concerns. Amendment 27 is a short but very important amendment. It says that ministers must spell out who should pay a charge for single-use items. Who should pay it? If I pop into a coffee shop and ask for an Americano and maybe a sandwich, they're likely to both come... Sorry. I apologise, Mr Simpson. OK. Just when you're ready. Right. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll start... Mr Simpson, maybe okay. you can go on with it, yes. Uh, Mr Torres, uh, Mr Simpson, can I just say, actually, you know, we've got to give the member the right to speak, but I, I don't think it, we want to get into any sort of thing where you're drawing attention to things, Mr Simpson. So I'm very happy for you to speak. Mr Doris yeah, will be conscious you. to allow you to speak. Yeah, but, and, and you have apologised. Yes. Thank you very can much. Can we park that there, please, Mr Simpson? Absolutely. So if I pop into a coffee shop and ask for an Americano and maybe a sandwich, uh, they're likely to both come in containers, which I might just throw away single-use items. They may be compostable, of course, which if the committee has accepted the previous amendment uh, wouldn't, wouldn't apply. They're likely to be covered by this section, though, so the question is who pays the charge? Is it the producer of the containers who supplies the coffee shop, who could be anywhere in the world? Is it the coffee shop itself? Or is it me, the consumer? And again, businesses need to know, and consumers need to know, particularly if they are to be hit with a sarni and coffee tax. Now, the minister may say this is already covered in the bill, but let's look at the wording. It says, the regulations may in particular include provision about 10A, the circumstances in which the requirement applies, 1B, the suppliers to whom the requirement applies, it may include provision. That can also mean it may not. And my view is that it should include provision, so the wording of my amendment has the word must, which is a far stronger legal position. Now, moving on to Amendment 29, and we're still on Section 9 here. Introducing such charges could have a major impact on small and micro businesses. If anything, it will be an administrative burden. Businesses are up against it, uh, and these charges could be just the thing that tips some over the edge. So this amendment would allow for the payment of grants and loans to help such businesses deal with the impact of these charges. It doesn't say must, it says may, and maybe I've gone a bit soft there. So to that extent, it allows ministers to budget. Of course, a better solution would be to get rid of Section 9 altogether. It's too onerous. We'd be better off without it. Um, I'm not the only one with concerns about charges for single-use items. The committee's report highlighted concerns from business and other stakeholders about the potential impact of these charges, and they recommended that this must go, quotes, go hand in hand with other measures to promote reusable alternatives as a social norm and a positive choice. And the committee also recommended a strategic approach to the use of the powers in Section 9 and suggested that initial regulations on charges for single-use items should be subject to a super affirmative procedure. A very good idea indeed. The Minister told the committee that regulating single-use items required using the right tool for the right job. Now, I'm not convinced that Section 9 is the right tool or that charges for the supply of single-use items is the right job. 
What about the unintended consequences of these charges for those who rely on single-use products? Local retailers and hospitality venues will have to pick up the ad additional administrative and logistical slack that this would create. UK Hospitality Scotland told the committee, I'm nearly at the end, convener, they said adding a cost to the price of purchasing single-use items will penalise Scottish businesses and consumers. For example, they say, it is envisaged that a charge of 20p could be applied to single-use cups. This may result in lost business for high street premises as customers choose not to make a purchase and pay the extra. Given, they go on, we're in a cost of living crisis, anything that can dent consumer confidence and spend is unwelcome, further jeopardising business and jobs. Now, do we really want to jeopardise business by placing further burdens on them from additional charging? So my other amendments have suggested some ways in which to make these regulations less burdensome, but it might well prove better just to scrap this section of the bill altogether, and that's what Amendment 35 would do. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Graham. Uh, do any other members wish to contribute? I think, Ben, you wanted to, to come in at this stage. Th thank you, convener. Um, I, I thought the minister might speak first, so apologies, minister, if um, this uh, precedes some of the things you might want to say, but uh, I just think that um, Mr Simpson brings some important points to the Chamber and having heard the voice of small business during the stage one proceedings, I think the considerations on what impact uh, charges for single-use items would have on small businesses when in competition with larger companies, sometimes multinational companies, uh, could prove uh, difficult in terms of the way that single-use item charges, for example, on coffee cups, would uh, disincentivise people to purchase on the go and uh, would create a logistical challenge for smaller businesses. That being said, I think this is a power that the government is right to want to take in a piece of primary legislation, and the considerations thereafter would be on the deployment and utilisation of this power. And I know that the government uh, would and, and future governments would be careful uh, and cautious about impacts on businesses when utilising this power. So I think there is a, 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 a debate to be had on this uh, in terms of when and what it should be used for. Uh, but as things stand, I, I think in the circular economy bill, it is important to, to take this power. But um, I would just conclude by saying that I uh, would, would urge government and future governments to, to think very carefully about putting the cost and emphasis of creating a circular economy onto the consumer, onto the, the individual, rather than onto the, the businesses. So uh, I, I thank Mr Simpson for bringing these amendments, but I would also urge him perhaps not to move them at this juncture and to have further dialogue with the government and uh, see if there's a, a better position that can consensually be arrived at at stage three. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, Douglas, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I'm going to say a few things um, briefly because the, the when and what I think is a, a good point that's been, been raised by the deputy convener. But this, I guess the, the problem with this legislation is that once it's passed today, there won't be any more debate in the chamber. Sorry, once it's passed stage stage three, that will be it, and you know the time for consultation will will really um, be gone. And we often hear coffee cups mentioned, but this is far wider than coffee cups. This could be used for. You know, there's points raised by Graham Simpson. You know, fish and chips wrappers was was one thing, but there's other things like you know. Tins, tins of beans, you know, well that, is that a container? So will that also be, be charged? There's also unknowns about VAT. I don't know if that's been, you know, been uh, sort of discovered by the, um, by the government whether, you know, VAT would be payable on, on this charge as, as well. So there is a, quite a lot that we, we don't know, which makes it quite difficult to, um, of course, yeah. I find it actually quite helpful explaining some of the concerns. Mr Lumsden, we had a debate 
um, during our stage one scrutiny and preparation for the report in relation to how much of a framework bill this should be. And one mm. of the reasons for it to be a framework bill was that a lot of this, these matters that you're raising, Mr Lumsden, needs to be ironed out and putting that on the face of the bill may not be, may be impractical or too rigid. So there's a balance, Mr Lumsden, would you accept that? I do accept there's a balance. And he, he, Mr Doris knows my position on, on framework bills. And I think this is the, the reason why I'm so much against it is because we're in a, a situation now where we'll actually be approving this, or the government may be approving this, and there's still not the detail there that I think we need to do our do our jobs um, properly, and it, it just sums up the actual problem that we have. So there is things like what it's, um, um, you know, what it will uh, what will cover. I think VAT is something else. Unintended consequences is, is something that's been mentioned by by Graham Simpson as well. It may make, you know, a, a people ordering a a cup of coffee less affordable. Um, so I think there'll be ways, and you know, we're serious about a circular economy. There could have been ways that the government could have attacked, uh, attacked this in a, a different way. And that's more of a, I think we discussed in sort of committee time about maybe more sort of reusable coffee cups that you would go to, you know, each each vendor would have the, the same cup they would take and, and give back. But that hasn't came forward. And I think that would give us a real circular economy. Just having a, a tax on things is probably not the right way of doing it. Okay. Uh, Monica Lennon. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, nice to come in after Douglas Lumsden, who is very passionate there about reusable items. Just hold that thought, Mr Lumsden. Um, just briefly to support Amendment 25 from Graeme Simpson um, in terms of um, biodegradable items being exempt. I think it's important where people are already um, trying to be more circular and environmentally friendly, that they're not penalised for that. So happy to support 25. And I think Amendment 26 provides some helpful clarity for business. Um, I won't support Amendment 35, the one that would strip out Section 9 of the bill. I think that part of the bill is, is important. Thank you, Convener. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, looking around to see if there are any other members. Before I come to the Minister, can I just add into this debate? I always find it interesting uh, when clarity is sought on issues that the government's position is always to ask the member to withdraw the amendment so further consultation could take place. Of course, there is the other option that the government could support the amendment and then seek to amend it at stage three, which would show an absolute willingness to want to contribute. <laughs> From my point of view, I find it interesting uh, that it appears on the face of the bill that we could end up uh, taxing things which are biodegradable. Surely the whole point of uh, the biodegradable item uh, and the investment in it is to ensure that it is not going to go into landfill, which are significant steps. I think the issues also of who's going to pay is an interesting one um, and, and where the VAT lies, which I haven't had explained. So uh, I, I am minded to seek clarity by, by agreeing to many of these amendments uh, to force the government to come back at stage three uh, to uh, define their position rather than just say that they may do it before stage three. And on that note, if there's no other member that wishes to speak, I'm happy to pass to the minister. Minister, good Thank morning you. anyway. Thank you, convener, and good morning to everyone. Um, I just want to, um, first of all, start off by addressing some, some general points that were made about the regulations that this would uh, uh, allow um, to, to be brought forward. Regulations under this section, section nine, first of all, are already subject to a super affirmative procedure. I think that was welcomed by the, 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 the committee and would be subject to that high level of scrutiny uh, before being laid. Everything that the government, uh, any government, um, uh, proposed to apply a charge to would be uh, an SSI um, with uh, the parliamentary scrutiny that comes uh, along with that. Convener, the Scottish Government can't support any of the amendments. If I can maybe get a little bit of a, a, a start on uh, <clears throat> my, my points and then I'll take Mr Lumsden in. Um, can't support any of the amendments from Graeme Simpson in this group. But of course, as with everything, happy to speak to Mr Simpson about some of the things that he wants to uh, 
that, that some of the concerns that he has are around, around some of these. But I'm going to lay out my, my, my reasons for, for not supporting them at stage two. If I can take amendments 24, 25, 26 together, they relate to exempting items from future regulations made use, uh, proposed under the new power in the bill. Amendment 24 seeks to prevent the, the use of power to charge for single-use items if they would be within the scope of a deposit return scheme or any reuse uh, schemes. But without a specific definition, it's not entirely clear what the, the term any reuse schemes actually means and therefore what the impact would be of exempting these schemes from future charges. Um, but the committee will be aware that at the moment um, the Scottish Government is having discussions with the UK Government, Welsh and Northern Irish uh, governments about a future UK-wide DRS uh, scheme as well. I'll take Mr Lumsden. Just an initial point you made about uh, the scrutiny process. You know, yes, it would have to come uh, as an SSI, but do you accept that it would only be a yes or no at that stage? And you know, any chance to, to make amendments to make it better is, is passed. So, uh, Mr Lumsden has, has, has been in the Parliament a few years now, will know that associated with an SSI, the committee can make any deliberations about what evidence they want to take. The government, of course, will go out to consultation. So, a number of people have mentioned today about um, business um, impacts. Of course, it's our duty to, to consult with businesses ahead of any of, of this. Uh, it's speculative throwing around um, you know, uh, chip papers, etc., etc. at the moment. is really doing that process a bit of a disservice because it would be a, 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 an, a, an, an opportunity for scrutiny, but of course consultation, and we wouldn't want to do anything that would be disproportionate. Um, we are going to consider the caref carefully the policy interactions and implications of any future deposit return schemes and charges on single-use items. We may agree in principle that any item subject to deposit would also not be subject to a charge, but we don't know what the DRS scheme is going to look like uh, yet. We are still in those discussions with the UK and, as I say, the other devolved governments as well. So it's not possible to evaluate at this point all of the future policy interactions. So I can't agree to anything that's going to restrict uh, something that we might need in the future. Um, Amendment 25 seeks to exempt items which are uh, biodegradable. Um, without a specified environment and time frame and proper definition, the term biodegradable is problematic here. It's an unclear term. And I noticed that Mr Simpson uh, often um, mentioned compostable and then biodegradable. They're two very separate things. I mean, uh, products are typically referred to as biodegradable or single use with their own set of waste management charges. Actually, the major a majority of, of, of uh, materials... Uh, found in, in any kind of light litter stream are eventually biodegradable. But how do you, uh, how do you uh, term it? How, ma how many years do they, bi bi how do do they degrade over? So exempting biodegradable... Uh, let me just finish my point. Exempting biodegradable, and using that term from charging, would create a significant potential loophole for suppliers to continue supplying single-use items without charging for them. And I think that would undermine the purpose of the charge. But more importantly, I think that might, because that loophole was there... I think it might mean that this, uh, any, any, uh, any moves we've got to reduce the amount of single-use items um, would, would not work at all. And this is, after all, uh, a bill that is aimed at improving the uh, recycling rates and uh, actually in the hierarchy, of course, of waste, of actually removing wasteful items from, from that, the, the, the economy uh, in general. So I think that, that actually, unfortunately, Mr Simpson, provides a loophole, which I, which I don't want to do, but I'll take your point. Yeah, um, I don't want to create legal loopholes either, um, but it sounds like uh, the Minister might accept what I'm trying to achieve, but she's just not happy with the wording. Yes, yeah, so I, I am... I, I mean, despite what Mr Simpson said at the start of his... Uh, I am open to discussing anything whether the intention is laudable. I understand why Mr Simpson has brought this through uh, today. I'm happy to work with them. I don't want to be in a situation where the use of language means that there was a loophole. So um, perhaps we can, we can discuss this ahead of stage three. Can Amendment I just, 26. Can I just come back again? Sorry? Can I intervene again? 
Thank you. I think that's very positive. That's actually what I've been trying to achieve with a number of my amendments, is that kind of discussion ahead of stage three, because this is a process. So I'll, I'll sum up when I sum up, but I think that's useful, um, and I'll certainly uh, be having that discussion with, with the Minister ahead of stage three. Amendment 26 seeks to require all regulations made under this power to include a list of exempt items, and any regulations made under this power have to specify the items for which a charge is to be applied. Therefore, it is unnecessary to require the regulations to specify a list of items which are exempt. Because if the re regulations do not specify a particular item, then will not be subject to the charge and therefore in effect will be exempt. I want to reassure Mr Simpson that secondary legislation is required to bring in a charge for item. As I said, there will be an uh, opportunity to consider the circumstances uh, in which that charge for a specific item will apply. Uh, turning to Amendment 27, I agree it is very important to clearly set out the scope of future charges made using these powers. I, do, I don't think this amendment is necessary. The focus of the power in the new section 87A is to allow ministers to set a charge for specified single-use items and require suppliers to levy that charge when they supply the goods to their customers. Uh, so the regulations do not need to specify who should pay the charge. Amendment 29, um, I mean, yes. Thank you. Um, does, does the Minister not think it's, it's really important that we know who pays the charge? You know, because I, you know, I set out a number of scenarios in my opening comments. You know, is it the supplier? Um, is it, if, if, if we're dealing with a, let's say, a coffee shop, is it the coffee shop? Is it the consumer? Do not think we need that sort of clarity. So, the, at the moment, the, the initial um, proposed items um, that would be subject to regulation should this bill pass would be around um, single-use coffee cups, right? And we know that. So, we would require suppliers to levy that charge. That's what this power is going to do when they supply the goods to their customers. And I think that's quite clear who, who that would be. Um, I'm going to, I think I, right, I was on Amendment 29. Scottish ministers already have the power to pay financial assistance to small and micro businesses. Um, the, if I can actually get through a point, that would, that would be great. Um, ministers already have the power to pay financial assistance to any person, including micro uh, businesses, small businesses, for any scheme or programme for the purpose of preventing or reducing waste. So I don't believe that Amendment 29 is necessary. And I'll take Mr Lumsden. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention, because it, it is quite a key point in my mind. When you say a supplier, do you mean the supplier to the coffee shop or do you mean the coffee shop to the customer? The, the supplier of the, the drink in the coffee cup seems quite clear to me. So it's not the person that's supplying the coffee shop with the cups? It's how far down the chain. That's why we're, we're, I think that's so, the, the whole point of this um, Mr Lumsden amendment. will be familiar with the single-use um, carrier bag charge. So that's what is proposed here. Okay, thank you. Just come in, just so I can clarify my brain, is what, what, what you're saying is the supplier of the, in a single-use coffee <clears throat> cup case, the, su the supplier of the coffee in the coffee cup will, will uh, uh, charge the purchaser of the, the, the coffee. So, and so you, sorry, hold on, Minister, if I may just finish uh, this question, is I'm trying to understand, it, you then equated it to the single-use carrier bag charge where suppliers voluntarily collect the money from that and give it to charities that they're using. Is that what you're suggesting here as well? Because it seems to me you started off with it was the supplier, which could have been China, for example, of coffee cups. Then it comes the supplier of the coffee cup. And now you're saying it's like a single-use carry bag and the supplier may be asked to give some of that money to charity. I'm, I'm, I just seek clarity, Minister. Yeah, I'll be as clear as I possibly can. The proposal is, if we take single-use coffee cups as an example, at the point at which you buy a takeaway coffee in a cup, the point of sale, there will be a charge applied in the same way that there is with the carrier bag. It will be applied at the point of sale. 
Sorry, Minister. Uh, would you take an intervention? Who keeps the money from the supply of, of the uh, item? Sorry, that was a bit rude of me. I apologise again. <laughs> Through myself, uh, yeah. Minister, could you clarify who would keep the money from the uh, charge? Yeah, um, so uh, you're asking... Yeah, I've actually got it in my speaking notes, but obviously uh, these are this, this, this particular part of the bill is to allow the regulations to come forward, which would have all of that scrutinised, you know, as to where right. the money goes, in the same way that the, the overall purpose of this power, if I can be clear, is to reduce the reliance on single-use items. The power that we are talking about now uh, regarding the proceeds, proceeds of sale is identical to that contained in the Climate Change Scotland Act for carrier bags, and regulations brought forward to introduce any charges under this section would provide further detail. I think that's quite clear, and, and, and uh, I, I was hoping that I would be being helpful by making that correlation to the example that everyone is familiar with, uh, with the use of carrier bags. Uh, Amendment 35 would delete section 9 of the bill, um, which is, is unfortunate because, um, I mean, I've, I've just extended uh, to, to Mr Simpson the ability to talk about some of the issues that he has raised about section 9. Yes. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, clearly, the Scottish Government's pick this area as a policy intervention, so I'm just wondering what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the emissions reductions as a result of this policy intervention. So, because this policy uh, intervention is about the power to um, levy additional charges onto single-use items, it's the point at which you decide on which items are going to be subject to this charge will be the point at which you can do an assessment of the nature that Mr Golden suggests. Amendment 35, uh, delete the section of the bill, therefore I can't support it, convener. Thank you. Uh, I uh, call on Graham Simpson to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 24. Mr Simpson. Yeah, um, thank, you. thank you very much, uh, convener. I think it's been an interesting discussion. Uh, and can I thank the members who have contributed, you know, Ben McPherson, Douglas Lumsden and Monica Lennon um, have all made good points, but I think the, uh, the final exchange there with the, the, the Minister was quite revealing uh, in that I don't think there is enough clarity uh, in cer certain sections of the Bill as written. Uh, and the Minister didn't really clear up for me. Um, who would who would pay these charges? Uh, because we have to go what's, with what's actually written in the bill. Um, I'm very happy to uh, talk to the minister about Amendment 25 or any any other amendment. Um, I kind of guess that she wouldn't want to obliterate Section 9. Of course, I did, but uh, uh, I probably won't move that one. But uh, as for the rest, um, hopefully they're up for discussion. Um, so when myself and the Minister sit down uh, to chat about Amendment 25, perhaps we can widen that and talk about other things that, where we may be able to uh, get consensus. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I wonder in advance of Stage 3, it might be beneficial if the Committee and Parliament were to understand why, in this case, charges for single-use items as a policy intervention was chosen over other policy interventions in order that we can better understand the impact on emissions, on behaviour change, on circular economy, because at the moment I'm not clear and I wonder if the member is clear why we're discussing this particular policy intervention. I'm not really any clearer than Mr Golden on this. Um, and I think the level of detail that he asks for um, is essential, uh, and we don't really have it. I mean, I just, I, you know, I listed uh, a number of products that I might encounter in my day-to-day -day life, but there'll be a whole lot of others that I've not thought of that could be um, could be caught by. Yes. 
Uh, I'm just wondering um, if Mr Simpson agrees with me that, uh, as we discussed at stage one, it's important to consider single-use item charges on different items uh, within the particular circumstances. For example, the charge for plastic bags from memory was more to do with the effect of plastic bags in the natural environment and how uh, damaging they were and are as a, as a pollutant in the natural environment and, and uh, whether that's in, in rivers or in woodland or uh, in terms of wildlife um, choking on plastic. Mm. Whereas, just to use the example, a, a plastic cup is, is quite a different, uh, sorry, a, not a plastic cup, a disposable cup is quite a different item. Uh, and also uh, the way that consumers can, uh, for example, put a, a, a reusable bag in their pocket and a reusable cup in their pocket is quite a different um, consideration. So I, I think we would all uh, do well to consider different items within the circumstances rather than uh, being uh, wide-ranging in the in using the plastic bag charge as somehow a justification that single-use item charges would be beneficial for, for the other items. Mr. Mr. McPherson uh, is a very uh, considered member uh, and usually makes uh, very good points, as he has on this occasion. Um, I, didn't, I didn't refer to the plastic bag charge because Mr. McPherson is uh, absolutely right. I, I think the main point of that charge was to reduce lit littering um, I certainly reuse plastic bags, and I'm sure Mr. McPherson does as well. Um, but I think uh, it, it, he's right to say there are different product, different products uh, should, can be can be treated differently. But uh, yes, of course. From the point of clarity, yes. Mr. Simpson, accept that the section nine is to give the power to put a charge on items when regulations are brought forward which actually specify that item and then allow Parliament a chance to scrutinise that on its own merit rather than having a list of items already in the face of the bill. It is the power to allowed, allow a charge on specified items in regulations in the future. I think the... I mean, the minister makes a reasonable point, except that those of us who know how affirmative or super affirmative works, um, we, we should all know that they are not subject to the same level of scrutiny as you would get uh, when putting something on the face of the bill. So the minister said earlier, you know, we can go out to consultation on all this. The problem is, for members of this parliament, the, ab the ability, there is no ability to change what the government puts forward. There just isn't. So it's either, as Mr Lumsden said, a yes or a no. And that's the, that's the problem with framework bills. And we're seeing an increasing use of framework bills, as the committee said uh, in its report. So, yes, of course. Following with great interest the, the debate, uh, when thinking about Amendment 26, Mr Simpson, about putting a list of items that would be exempt from a charge on the face of the bill, um, would, would, would the member consider that there's a possibility that any item not on the face of the bill by definition could lead to concern that <coughs> every item that's not on the face of the bill might be considered for, a, for, for such a charge, which wouldn't be the case? The power to levy a charge doesn't mean if you're not exempt on the face of the bill that that's been actively considered. So having a finite list on the face of the bill could lead to greater anxiety. It could also mean that as new products are made and become available, that we would need primary legislation to add to that list. Now, that's not a reason not to support Amendment 26, but would the member appreciate that's two drawbacks from Amendment 26? Well, Mr Doris makes a reasonable point. I actually... Um, thought I'd made that point um, in, in my opening comments that you could have because I was anticipating this argument from the Minister that 
you know, if you if you went with this amendment, uh, then the minister, whoever it was, uh, m might have to yeah, provide a, a very very long list uh, of particular items which are exempt. Which is why I um, offered the alternative of categories, which would be a much shorter list. So that might be a better way forward for stage three, which is why I referred to this being a process. Now, I didn't hear the minister take me up on that, uh, but the offer's still there. So perhaps, um, you know, on reflecting on Amendment 26, um, as you heard last week, I do reflect on things um, time, Mr. in real time. Perhaps that is too onerous, but there might be a better approach, a different approach for stage three. But that requires cooperation from the minister. So if there are no further interventions, I'm happy to take further. Yes, Mr. Ruskell wants in. Thank you. Uh, it's been a, an interesting debate. But can, in summing up, can you just say, do you believe that there is a role for single-use item charges at all? Because, I mean, what I've heard has been pretty negative from yourself. Um, I'm not, not quite sure about the analogy of chip papers. I certainly wouldn't want to reuse chip papers again uh, as a consumer. But I'm just wondering what, what you actually see as the role of single-use charges, because it has been effective in relation to carrier bags. There has been a, a long-standing policy development about the use of uh, charges in relation to uh, coffee cups and other, other hot drink cups. So I'm just... I'm just interested to know your, the kind of thrust of, of what it is you're trying to achieve from this. If it's clarity by putting more requirements on the face of the bill uh, in relation to schemes that are brought forward or trying to design in exemptions around, you know, the nature of biodegradability and everything else, I can, can understand where you're coming from. But it does seem to be quite a, quite a negative place that you don't actually fundamentally see a use for these kind of charges, which may be seen as punitive, but nonetheless, it could be argued have a pretty critical role in terms of reducing waste and delivering behavioural change. So. Okay. Um, can I thank Mr. Ruskell for that uh, in intervention? Um, useful comments as, as well. Um, I, th I think I would go back to what I said to Mr. McPherson. Um, was when he he made comment about the plastic bag charge. You know, I think I think that was about redu reducing littering. Um, where, you know, and I think so. I think I think to pick him up on his his point was we need to look at different products differently. So it depends what you're talking about, and that's why um, I was after you know, really wanting some more clarity um, on the face of the bill. Um, so that it doesn't be, it becomes less of a framework bill, uh, and that this com well, this committee at this point, uh, and the whole Parliament at stage three, would be able to say, well, actually, we're not happy just to leave all this to government and leave it to regulations, because of the problem with regulations, which Mr. Russell is well aware of. You know, when it comes, when the regulation comes back to this committee. <coughs> It would be a simple yes or no, and you wouldn't be able to tweak it uh, in the way that. Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm loath to mention it because, of course, Mr. Simpson knows the parliamentary processes very well, particularly given his previous convenorships. But, I mean, ministers do have a legal duty um, to take account of any report or resolution of the parliament. And the super affirmative process obviously gives that an extended amount of time for scrutiny of regulations about specific items. And obviously, before we were actually lay that in Parliament, we would, we, it wouldn't just be the, we may consult. We would consult. We are legally bound to consult on the implications of what we're producing. And so when laying the regulations, we need to give it a statement setting out the changes. But we also need to take into account what Parliament says in, in, in reaction to that. Well, if only every minister was as reasonable as Miss Martin, but... Uh, Unfortunately, it's not always the case, and you know we're, we we we're putting something into legislation which will last far beyond Miss Martin's tenure in this current post. Um, you know, it'll last into the 
the next parliament and beyond, presumably. So we need to get this right. Uh, and I just make the point again that regulations are not the same as putting something on the face of a bill. And increasingly, and I would say this applies to uh, the UK Parliament as well, there is an increasing trend to produce framework bills, and it's not healthy. It's not healthy for parliamentary scrutiny. So, which is, which is why I've put these amendments forward, just for some greater detail. But as I say, convener, as I close, unless there are any other interventions, which I'd be delighted to take um, if there are, um, yes? We've got lots of time, so let's, let's well, just no, use the time. It's yeah? very helpful. Um, I was just wondering, you know, the, the, the committee stage one report did go into <laughs> some detail around, you know, the options of putting more detail on the face of the bill or requiring effectively what, what you could call a super affirmative process, which was the process that was used originally for the establishment of the DRS regulations back in 2019 and it involved Parliament in advance of the regulations being lodged to take extensive evidence from stakeholders um, and, and to you know seek some reassurance from the Minister about how the regulations would be altered in light of that committee evidence before them being finally laid. So I'm just, I'm just wondering in bringing forward these amendments this morning if Mr Simpson had considered what an enhanced parliamentary process might look like because clearly you know co-production if it's with industry if it's with uh, COSLA and local authorities is really critical because these are the folk who are actually going to be delivering the schemes actually in practice aren't they they're going to be selling the coffee they're going to be taking cups back they're going to be administering charges all of that um, setting up you know um, systems for dealing with waste and biodegrading composting and all of that so I'm just I'm just interested if those if those people are the are the experts as organisations, surely there's a way to kind of bring that co-production uh, more into Parliament, allow greater scrutiny ahead of something, you know, being introduced, and you know, to write a scheme into the bill at this point without any of that co-production, without any of that scrutiny, would would perhaps you know ring alarm bells within industry, but an enhanced parliamentary process might be might be more appropriate, and I think where the committee was as we were kind of wrestling with with working out you know where that super affirmative process might add value to the bill and where it where it where it may not and, and actually an si process would be would be adequate um I, I think mr ruskell is making a very interesting point and he's probably talking about a whole new process one that we don't have at the moment um, I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Doris's screen where he's, got, he's looking up what super affirmative SSIs are. But I think never, never took an intervention. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't me. No, but, but, uh, but I, I, I think, I, yes, I will, I will let you in. But I think I think um, I don't blame you for looking because not everyone quite understands uh, these different processes. In a bit here because. Uh, uh, I'm sure everyone knows processes of Parliament far better than I do and will give me an opinion on whether I've interpreted them properly or not. But the idea of the stage two debate is, is that yeah. we go through the debate of the principles, the member who's mo moving the motion uh, or the amendment speaks to that amendment, the other amendments in the group, and then there is a debate at that stage. And then the minister comes in, if the minister hasn't spoken already, and responds to the member. And then the member sums up at the end. It is not another area for debate. So <clears throat> I would gently remind members, for fear of being uh, picked up and chided on for my understanding of the parliamentary procedure, if we could try and stick to that procedure, there is some hope that we will get through this before day six which I would love to extend it to if, if, if the members want to debate it to that stage, but I don't think it would be helpful for allowing further debate at stage three. So I am going to push Mr Simpson to wind up on, on this group of amendments um, and uh, uh, let's see how we can go forward. Can you Mr. Well, I, I, I think it's entirely appropriate, as, as I do, at all stages during the parliamentary process to check 
entirely what it means. I've been here as a convener of this committee for seven years, and sometimes I have to check procedures and things as well. So I don't think it's a derogatory naming, uh, no, Mr. Doris. But there's a bit of clarity there, because an assumption has been made by Mr. Simpson. So if I could intervene in a constructive fashion, it would maybe add something to the debate. <laughs> I'm happy to let Mr. Doris right. intervene, right. and then I shall wind up. So, so, then, so the intervention point I would make is that, just for clarity for Mr. Simpson, I used to chair the support legislation in this committee before it was called DPLR, mm -hmm. and we, we were looking at super affirmative at that stage. What I was wanting clarity on, because this is very important, is that draft regulations be published for up to 90 days before uh, final regulations were published and laid before Parliament, and there would be a dynamic parliamentary process where the minister would have to demonstrate amendments made at that point. At the point we were looking at super affirmative convener, the parliament at that time thought that was a substantial level of scrutiny. I still agree with that, and I think it's reasonable for this piece of legislation. So I'd I would get a clarity from Mr Simpson, because I wouldn't support on the face of the bill convener. I think that would be wrong. So I would put it back to Mr Simpson. If not super affirmative, then what? Thank you, Mr Doris, for that. Every day is a learning day in the Parliament for me as well. So, Mr Simpson, I am going to ask you to address that specific point and wind up, please. Uh, press or move your amendment. Or yeah, press I'll, or withdraw I'll, your I'll amendment. Be, I'll, be real, I'll be really, really quick. Um, I, I think um, affirmative and super affirmative um, have limitations, and I would probably go back to what I think Mr Ruskell was suggesting. But others have suggested it in the past that perhaps we need... Um, after 25 years of this Parliament, uh, some new process. But we're not here to deal with that. Um, we're here to deal with, as you rightly say, convener, uh, the amendments in this group, so I'll wind up at that point. Could I ask you if you are pressing or withdrawing Amendment 24? Um, amendment 24, I will not move. Uh, on the basis of the... No, of the Mr Simpson, it is a question of move or not move. Not you have move. decided not to... Not the member move. has decided not to move, pr press Amendment 24. Does any member wish to press that amendment? No one wishes to press that amendment. So I now call Amendment uh, 25 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not move. Uh, the amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 26 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Uh, not move. <coughs> the amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment uh, 27 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The amendment is moved. The uh, question is, as Amendment 27... Uh, Sorry, the question is that Amendment 27 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There were five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Graham Simpson to move or not moved? Was that... Amendment 28? Uh, no, it's Amendment 29, Mr Simpson. 29, OK. Um, I will not move that one. Thank you. Uh, the amendment is not moved. I call Amendment 28 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment uh, 87. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the amendment is moved. The question is, Amendment 28 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call, the amend I call Amendment 30 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendments 30 and 31 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, the amendment is not moved. I call Amendment 31 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is, Amendment 31 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are two votes for, there are five votes against that the, um, the amendment is not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 32 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Uh, again, I remind members that Amendments 32 and 33 are direct alternatives. Mr Simpson, to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 33 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson, to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 33 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hand. Those against, please raise their hands. Okay, there are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? The question is, Amendment 34 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. The question uh, is 35 now, is it? Yes. The question is that 30, uh, Amendment 35 in the name of Graham Simpson. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I call Amendment 35 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 24. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. The, uh, the amendment is not moved. The question, therefore, is that Section 9 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Right, before I go on to this next section, I just want to remind members of something I said last week and I've said before in these meetings. I'm a member of a family farming partnership in Murray. Uh, as such, we're involved in agriculture and we own land. I would also say that I have been on the receiving end of fly tipping on a regular basis. The last uh, two events was the dumping of mattresses and tyres uh, barely three weeks ago. So I do have an interest in this subject and I've made it clear. So I call Amendment 1201 in the name of Murdo Fraser, uh, grouped with Amendments 121, 202, 203 and 204. Um, I remind members that Amendments 201 and 121 are direct alternatives as shown in the group. Uh, and I think, uh, Douglas Lumsden, you are going to move Amendments 201 and speak to the amendments in the group. Uh, yeah. Douglas. Yes, thank you, Kabir. And just to remind uh, members of my declaration of interest, it should I was a local councillor at the start of this uh, session of Parliament. So, yes, yeah, I will move Amendment 201 and speak to the other amendments in the groups, and specifically 202, 203 and 204, which are in the name of my colleague, uh, Murdo Fraser. Uh, Murdo Fraser cannot be at the committee this morning due to a medical appointment and I will be putting forward these amendments and speaking to them on his behalf. As colleagues will be aware, Murdo Fraser has taken a keen interest on the provision in the bill on littering and fly tipping and has been preparing a member's bill on the issue. This seeks to improve data collection and publication, adjust the liability both on generators of waste and on the innocent owners of land on which waste is dumped, and to increase the penalties for offenders. The consultation responses to the Member's pro Bill proposal showed very strong support for each of these measures. I understand that Mr Fraser engaged with the Scottish Government, and specifically the Minister previously in charge of the Bill, uh, Lorna Slater around these issues and he asked me to put on record his thanks to the Minister for the very constructive engagement, engagement he had with her. So Amendment 201, turning to the, the detail of this amendment, uh, 201 deals with the issue of fixed penalty notices for fly tipping offences. It modifies Section 33A of the Environmental Protection Act 1990 to increase the maximum amount at which the penalty, fixed penalty for a fly tipping offence can be set by ministers from level two to level three on the standard scale, thereby increasing the maximum fixed penalty that might be set by secondary legislation from £500 to £1,000. Additionally, it gives ministers the ability to, to provide for different penalty amounts in different cases. For example, a higher penalty amount where a previous fixed pe penalty notice had been issued to the same person with a maximum amount not exceeding level three on the standard scale, i.e. £1,000. Previously, the maximum fixed penalty that could be charged was £200, but this was recently increased by secondary legislation to £500. However, it is my view and that of Mr Fraser that this does not go far enough, 
and there should be discretion for penalty notices to be issued up to a higher amount of £1,000. This would provide a stronger deterrent for those involved in flight open, particularly where it is part of a wider criminal activity. Amendment 202 addresses the question of liability on the part of an innocent land landowner on whose property waste has been dumped where they did not generate the waste or give permission for it to be deposited. Under Section 59.1 of the 1990 Act, liability for removal of the waste lies with the occup occupier of the land, who could face fines if waste is not removed. In addition, where an appropriate statutory body, such as the local authority or SEPA, step in to remove such waste, the cost of removal can be levied to the owner of the land. This is clearly an unfair practice, contrary to natural justice and going against the polluter pays principle. There is no a other area of public policy I can think of where the victim of a crime is held responsible for it or for paying the costs of another's actions. When Mr Fraser consulted on his members' bill proposal, there was very strong support, particularly from the farming and land-owning community, for a change in the law in this area. 85% of those responding to the consultation were fully supportive of the proposal that legal liability should be removed from the person who has waste deposited on their land, with a further 9% partially supportive. The proposal had particular support from the National Farmers Union of Scotland and Scottish Land and Estates, alongside a broad range of other respondents. Paragraph 79 of the policy memorandum occupying the bill specifically addresses this issue and states the following. The Scottish Government does not believe it is appropriate to move, remove liability from occupiers of land. The existing legislation does not place legal liability upon the occupier of the land, but does provide a means of compelling the occupier to move the waste in circumstances where there is substantial evidence that the landowner bears some responsibility for the deposited waste. However, the evidence suggests that this does not reflect actual practice, and there have been cases brought to us where the innocent landowner is compelled to remove waste under threat of penalty, despite there being no evidence that they had respons responsibility for it being deposited. The effect of Amendment 202 is therefore to remove the liability from the innocent landowner and instead place an obligation on SEPA in such cases to clear up waste illegally deposited on an innocent person's land. This seems to me a very fair and reasonable proposal, which I know would be enthusiastically supported by a wide range of stakeholders. Amendment 203 addresses the question of data collection on fly tipping. The Scottish Government acknowledges that currently the collection of data on fly tipping has a number of weaknesses. This amendment modifies the 1990 Act, granting powers to Scottish Ministers to require information from local authorities and the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park Authority in relation to reporting of, un of, reporting of incidents of unlawful depositing of waste, to allow collation and analysis of data around fly tipping, with the purpose of improving public access to data. This would also include cases where local authorities have used their powers under the Section 59 of the 1990 Act to remove unlawfully deposited waste. In addition, the amendment specifies a non-exhaustive list of the kind of information that can be requested, as well as stipulating that Scottish Ministers may not exercise this power more than once in a 12-month period per authority. The effect of this amendment will be to allow the better collection of data so we know the extent of the fly tipping issue. Amendment 204 is consequential to 203 and requires Scottish ministers to report annually to Parliament on the number of instances of fly tipping which it has collected information on, and also a number of other matters, including the number of fixed penalty notices which have been issued, the number of prosecutions, the number of convictions, and the total number of fines. Thank you, Kimira. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'd just like to declare my interest also as a former local councillor of Aberdeen City Council, because I realise that local authorities are being discussed at this present moment in time. Thank you very much. Uh, now I call on Edward Mountain, to sp that's myself, of course, to speak to Amendment 121. Apparently, I have to say Edward Mountain to make sure it appears on the record. Uh, so I've done that, and I'm now going to speak to Amendment 201. I submit it, uh, sorry, 201. 
201, sorry, not 201. Now, I submitted Amendment 121 ahead of Murdo Fraser's submitting Amendment 201, and I acknowledge the exceptional work that Murdo Fraser's done in relation to fly tipping. The reason why I submitted this amendment was to stiffen up the penalties for those people that are responsible for fly tipping. We should be under no illusion that fly tipping not only involves household waste, it also involves commercial waste and it involves industrial waste. And the waste that can be deposited on people's land is phenomenal. And those people who are responsible for dumping that waste can be just uh, people who can't be bothered to go as far as the dump, but they can be organised crime syndicates who are taking, uh, collecting rubbish and then dumping it out, or they could just be people who've been paid to dump it. Now, we heard in our stage one uh, evidence that it was really important that we stopped fly tipping and we made sure that it, it went to the right places to be recycled. Now, in most cases, it's very easy to go to a recycling dump and to take your rubbish there. Some councils have made it more difficult by organising booking systems, which are unhelpful in my opinion, but it is very easy to do that. However, rubbish still continues to be dumped in the countryside, and the point of my amendment was to increase the fine to put people off. It is deeply disconcerting when you spend a weekend picking up tyres, uh, stacking them into trailers and taking them down to the council tip to be charged three pounds for every tyre that you put in because somebody else has, has decided to dump it on, on your ground. Not so long ago, uh, I received a, a, a deep freeze full of food uh, from a shop that had obviously replaced their deep freeze. So rather stupidly, they left the name of the shop in, in the deep freeze, so I was able to return it to them. Um, but that is not always the case, and people do end up having to clear up rubbish, which is why I wanted to see an increased fine to make it entirely clear that it was inappropriate. Now, I believe that uh, Mr. Fraser and his amendments have spoken to the government clearly on this and reached some agreement. I therefore will not be pushing my amendment at stage two, but I will look at stage three to make it entirely clear that those people who are commercially benefiting from fly tipping on people's land, whether it be on farmland or in people's gardens, pay a maximum fine, and frankly, £1,000 as a cap doesn't do it. Um, that is all I have to say. Uh, yes, uh, I'd now look round for other people, and Mr Simpson wants to come in. Graham. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, convener. Um, I, I've got enorm enormous sympathy with what you're trying to achieve in, in 121, um, because we need to have uh, some kind of deterrent. There needs to be a stiffer deterrent than exists at the moment. We've probably all had cases of uh, industrial scale dumping um, in, in our patches. I mean, I had a, had a really disgusting case where a load of chicken carcasses were were dumped uh, uh, next to a stream. Um, we've all seen tyres getting dumped. Um, but I'd, I think I think I have a question which I'd like Mr. Lumsden to clear up. Maybe he can't because it's not his uh, his amendment. But on 202. Um, which I think is a very, uh, a very useful amendment, but would make uh, SEPA responsible for clearing things up. What it doesn't say, well, I can't see that it says, is within what time frame. So, I mean, we all know that, you know, when we have dumping, sometimes things can be left for years and nobody does anything about it. So I think that at some point, you know, either, either Mr. Fraser or Mr. Fraser working with the minister could perhaps cl clear that up, because I don't think we want to be in that position where, yes, SEPA are responsible, but they, they could just say, well, we'll, do, we'll get round to it um, at some point. I'm sure that's not what Mr. Fraser is trying to achieve. Uh, Monica, I think you want to come in. Um, thank you. 
convener and um, grateful for, for your remarks. Um, I think you spoke very well to, to this part of the bill. I think we all have examples of um, serious fly tipping in our own regions and constituencies. Um, I was um, asked to speak at a Keep Scotland Beautiful conference in my region just um, a couple of months ago. Um, so again, I think paying tribute to the volunteers who are out there trying to deal with litter and fly tipping um, every weekend and in fact every day of the week. Um, but people are really frustrated and there's also recognition that current um, regulations and enforcement practices are not robust enough. Mr Simpson was talking about SEPA and I'm interested to hear what Mr Lumsden says about that. Um, I know from my own um, research on my Ecoside Members Bill, people are saying, well, what can we do with existing powers to strengthen enforcement? But there's a big question mark there about resources for SEPA and for local authorities. So that leads me back to prevention uh, and having a deterrent, because the way we can try and save money here is to really uh, make it unattractive for these criminals and let's just call them what they are because some of it is on an industrial level some of it is organized crime which is a growing problem you know right across uh europe um there's been some interesting work by is it europol i think um and it's one of the fastest growing areas of crime around around waste and we've discussed it previously with michael matheson when he was net zero cabinet secretary um I think at that point there'd been a big programme on the BBC um, about it. Um, and it's something that I've discussed a lot with Lorna Slater in her previous role um, as Circular Economy Minister. So like Murdo Fraser, who's not here today, but I know he's done a power of work on this, um, grateful to Miss Slater for all her work. And it's interesting to hear that um, Murdo Fraser and Miss Slater had really constructive talks, because that is the side of Murdo Slater and, and Lorna Slater's relationship you don't really hear about often on social media or newspaper columns, but let's get that firmly on the record, because that's, you know, the reality is there's a lot of work goes on behind the scenes. So I think this is a universal problem across Scotland. It's, it is very much a, an issue for rural communities, but it's also an urban issue um, as well. Um, so I just really wanted to speak in favour of the, the amendments. I know that um, Edward Mountain won't be moving his today, uh, but really interested to hear what the Minister has to say, because I think this is about, it's about empowering our local authorities and other regulators like SEPA. It's about trying to get behaviour change, you know, on a nationwide level, um, because right now, those who are responsible for, for fly tipping, they're completely unfussed about the consequences of it. Um, there's not enough fines getting dished out. I've seen that through my own research. But I think the reaction to Murdo Fraser's bill has been really positive. So if, if it looks like the government won't be supporting Murdo's bill as a standalone piece of legislation, I would be keen to see how much of it can be brought into to the circular economy bill. So I will stop there, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll call the minister. Um, minister. Really uh, important debate to be had. Um, I mean, I recognise that fly tipping is a scourge. Um, I mean, we've, we've heard instances from, from members as to, to where they've uh, experienced fly tipping. Um, you know, I'm thinking in my constituency, fly tipping incidents happening near um, areas of natural beauty as well, like in the Bullers of Buchan, for example. Um, when I was visiting with RSPB, there was, we were walking past. Um, a whole lot of uh, rubbish that had been fly tipped at the entrance to that area of natural beauty. So we have to do what we can to tackle it. Um, we are going to uh, um, support uh, uh, Murdo Fraser's Amendment 201. It's consistent with our commitment to ensure an effective enforcement regime to deter and tackle the scourge of fly tipping. I, I do want to say, though, um, this, this amendment allows for future increase to a maximum amount, not exceeding level three in the standard scale, currently fixed at uh, £1,000. Uh, but I do want to also mention that fixed penalty notices are not the only uh, uh, way to tackle, and, and, and are not intended to tackle serious uh, uh, waste crime. It uh, has been discussed. SEPA has got the powers to impose up to £40,000 through variable monetary penalties, and serious or matters of organised crime needs to be referred to the police. 
there because A, there's a helicopter flying over and I'm struggling to hear you. Sorry, uh, I think it's passed, but my hearing's not great at the best of times, and so I couldn't hear. Sorry, Minister, would you like to continue? As, as, as Aberdonians are used to helicopters flying overhead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> so I just wanted to, to point that out as well. And in terms of um, compensation for private land owners, it's, I think it's uh, fair that those persons who unlawfully deposit waste are responsible for the cost of cleaning it up. It's important to remember that there are some important mechanisms that do that in place. For example, if an individual is convicted of fly tipping, a compensation, a compensation order can be made as well. All that withstanding, I absolutely understand the arguments that have been put forward. <clears throat> I recognise that a flat level of pick fixed penalty has its limitations, so I also agree with the proposal to enable ministers to set a different penalty amounts in different cases, um, and this will allow for a sliding scale of penalties, the maximum being £1,000. Uh, pounds. It will need uh, detailed consideration and consultation with local authorities and other enforcement bodies before these powers can be used. Now, I would uh, emphasise it is vital that more serious instances of fly tipping again are not addressed in, in this way and I think I have set out the other mechanisms that are, are there. So um, I urge the committee to support Mr Fraser's amendment um, and uh, <coughs> convener, I mean with the greatest respect, um, you know, I I, I uh, accept that you are not moving your amendment, but your, your, your arguments are, are valid. I mean, what, what, what more can we do in, in this area to deter people from, from fly tipping? But of course, we have accepted uh, Mr. Fraser's amendment, which means yours would have fallen away anyway. But I appreciate it's a conversation to be continued. In relation to Amendment 202 from Mr. Fraser, the Scottish Government can't support this, but I do stress that I want to work with Mr. Fraser. And he does know this. He's been working with my predecessor, uh, Ms Slater, and I have already spoken to him um, in, in a, a, a less formal way in the corridor to say that I'm happy to have discussions with him about what more we can do. Um, so the Amendment 202 would have had the effect of replacing Section 59 of the Environmental Protection Act 1990 with a new provision giving SEPA responsibility for the removal of all unlawfully deposited waste and the associated costs of that removal from any private land in Scotland. And, and although I, I absolutely recognise the frustration that private landowners feel, I don't agree that SEPA should be responsible for the removal of all waste fly tipped on private land. Um, the purpose of section 59 is to give powers to authorities to address waste on land where they would otherwise be unable to do so because the land is private. Section 59 notices should only be served where SEPA or local authorities consider that the occupier fly tipped the waste or knowingly caused it or permitted the waste to be fly tipped. Uh, under Section 59, SEPA and local authorities also have powers to remove the waste themselves when the occupier is innocent of responsibility or the waste is causing environmental harm, and those powers are at their discretion. Ms Lennon. Thank you, Minister. I um, enjoy hearing your kind of response to, to these amendments there. Um, in terms of this particular one, I don't know if you would have the figures at hand just now, but do you know how many notices SEPA are serving, you know, approximately per year on that on that power. And I just wondered if SEPA had responsibility for clearing the fly tip and do you think that that could make SEPA more proactive in this space? Because my general perception is that there's not enough notices actually getting served and people feel that the enforcement side of things is not really working. Um, it's something that I've looked at through my own research on, on Ecoside, which is looking at much higher level crimes. Um, if you don't have the figures today, it would be interesting, I think, to see that, because there is a perception, certainly, that the powers are not being used as, as often as they should be. Yeah, um, I have those figures in front of me. I think, as Ms Lennon would, would appreciate. Um, but what I would say um, is about the amount of fixed penalty notices. There's another part to this as well, that if there's evidence, if anyone had evidence of Section 59 notices been inappropriately or unfairly applied, then this should be highlighted to me. Um, 
to me or to SEPA themselves. Um, oh, I just have, my, my officials have just said that SEPA has issued 17 Section 59 notices in the last three years. So there you go. We did have that information to hand. It was just that 17? Me. Sorry, okay. Se 17 Section 59 notices. So the purpose of uh, Section 59, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself. Under Section 59, SEPA and local authorities also have powers to remove waste themselves. As I said, this power is used at their discretion, you know, where they are convinced that the occupier is innocent of, of, of being responsible. On that yes, point. I will. Um, I, I absolutely understand that power uh, uh, sits in legislation, but most landowners will get a letter from their council informing them that they have a responsibility to remove it. The, the council in most cases are not clear that the, the landowner has an appeal, so invariably it is the landowner that gets to pick up the rubbish. And I know, for example, in Murray, I don't think there's been a single issue of a fly tipping notice issued to any individual so do you think the councils could do more minister well what, what i do know is that repealing section, section 59 is not the answer here and i have said on record and and to mr fraser uh, privately that i'm willing to talk about to him about what more we can do in in this area um to ensure that there's support for private land owners and occupiers in tackling fly tipping on their land. And I'm open to suggestions as to what that could be from Mr Fraser. Um, so I urge the committee not to support this amendment uh, today. Um, amendment 203 and 204, um, given the importance of developing a national understanding of the level of fly tipping in Scotland, the Scottish Government is happy to support amendment 203 from Murder Fraser, happy to engage with him on the proposals in amendment 204, I will in a second, Mr. Mr. Simpson. Um, so I just want to be clear again that Amendment uh, 2 or 3 will be supporting from Murdoch Fraser, but I am happy to engage with him on the proposals in Amendment 2 or 4, although we can't uh, support that amendment as it currently is written. Um, Amendment 2 or 3, we agree this could fill a gap in the existing data and works already underway through the National Litter and Fly Tipping Strategy to improve data collection from local authorities and park authorities. But it is, at the moment, relying on voluntary reporting. I'll take Mr Simpson now. Convener. Thank the Minister for taking the intervention. I just want to uh, jump back to 202. I mean, my concern is if we do nothing, we could just end up uh, in, in the, back in the, the place we are now where landowners, often farmers, but not necessarily farmers, w can have and do have um, quite often um, large-scale dumping on their land, which is not their fault. Um, and as I said earlier, it can sit there for, I mean, I know in my own area, a very, a very good example, and quite close to where I live, where you know, dumping um, blocked a lane um, for several years, and not the, not the landowner's fault. Somebody else just came along and, uh, over a sustained period, used that lane as a dump. Um, so are we not in danger, unless we find a solution for stage three, and I hear what the minister says, are we not in danger of just remaining in that unfortunate position? Yep. Um, Mr Simpson's making the same points that many people have about the, the, the scourge of fly tipping and uh, the unfairness that exists when uh, landowners have to, to clear it up. We, it's not fair to say that there's nothing been done. It's a, a fly tipping forum, uh, the delivery of the National Litter and Fly Tipping Strategy Year One Action Plan, number of activities that are aimed at tackling fly tipping in private land. But I think I've been very clear that I want to work with Mr Fraser on the sentiment behind his amendment. Uh, I call on Douglas uh, Lumsden to wind up on behalf of yeah. Murdo Fraser and push or, or press or withdraw Amendment 201. Douglas. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Convener, and uh, thank you to the Minister as well for accepting some of the amendments put forward in um, Murdo Fraser's name. Happy that 201 has been um, been agreed. You know, the whole intention behind that is to try and you know increase the uh, the fines to try and stop people um, fly tipping. So we you know we don't have organisations like SEPA having to to, to get involved. Um, in terms of 202, I think 
you know, I think that's a, a key thing. But I'm glad that the minister is saying that she's going to work with Mardu Fraser to get that into a, a state that maybe can be um, accepted at um, stage three. So I won't be moving that when it when it comes to it, because I think it is quite key that um, you know it, it, it can't be right that we've got innocent landowners who are doing absolutely nothing wrong having to pick up the bill for, for someone else. It, it seems so unfair and, and probably would, wouldn't happen um, anywhere else. But I accept the, the comments made by the, the Minister. Instead of two or three, I'm glad that that's being uh, accepted. Uh, also, we need a lot more data on fly tipping uh, to see how big a problem it is. I think we all know it's a problem, but we need that data behind it. And uh, happy that um, the, the Minister is going to work on 204 with Mardu Fraser also to try and get that into a, a situation that can be, of course. Yep. Um, I, I don't want to give any impression that we're working on with Mr Fraser on the repealing of Section 59. We're working about uh, to deal with the, the reasons why uh, Mr Fraser put forward that amendment in the first place, to, to reach a, a, a better communication, the scope, scope for further guidance to achieve what he wants to with that amendment. Uh, absolutely, I accept that. And uh, on that, thank you, convener. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can I just confirm that you have a uh, pressed amendment 201? Yes. Okay, so the question is, the amendo to, amendment 201 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Okay, I remind members that amendments 201 and 121 are direct alternatives. I call amendment, this sounds very odd, I call amendment 121 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with amendment 201, Edward Mountain to move or not move. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to move chairs. Anyway, it's not moved. The amendment is not moved. Uh, therefore, I call amendment 202 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 201, um, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move uh, on behalf not, of Murdo. Not moved. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the amendment is not moved. I call amendment 203 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 201. Murdo Fraser, uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? Uh, moved, Kavina. Uh, the question is that amendment 203 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 204 in the name of Murdo Fraser, already debated with amendment 201. Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? Not moved, Kavina. Thank you. Uh, right, we have now come to a gap that is a. Uh, sorry, it wasn't moved. Uh, sorry, we've now come to a gap uh, where it is appropriate to take a small break. Uh, can I just say to members, it's now 9:57. I would like you back here um, as close to 10:05 as possible, please. Thank you, and I suspend the meeting.
Okay. I reconvene the uh, meeting of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee on stage two of the uh, Circular Economy Bill. We are making slow and steady progress. So I'm going to call Amendment 157 in the name of Monica Lanning, Group with Amendments 158, 159, 216 and 170. Monica Lennon to move the amendment uh, 157 and speak to all the amendments in the group. Monica. Thank you, Convener. Um, move the amendment and speak. I'll speak to these amendments in this section, which is free provision of reusable items. And I think in terms of waste hierarchy, um, there has been a desire to see more uh, about reuse and, and refill and repair in the bill, because I think some people unfairly have called it a recycling bill. So we want to make sure that it's not seen as a recycling bill only. Um, so. I don't have to speak to them in any particular order, do I, convener? So can I <laughs> can I jump ahead um, to I'll, I'll speak about the, the nappies first um, because they're obviously uh, grouped together. So I'll speak to 157, 158, and 170. So we heard in our stage one evidence that single-use nappies are identified as a problem in terms of waste stream contamination. That's because when they're sent to landfill, often with baby waste uh, included, um, and they can end up in the wrong bins as, as well. So we know that they do cause a bit of a stink in, in more ways than one, but we know that there is a colossal amount of single-use nappies going to landfill, not just in Scotland, but across the UK and indeed globally. But it's a big issue for us in, in the UK. Um, environmentally, it's damaging, but it's a really expensive issue. And using disposable nappies, there's a convenience factor, but they're also very expensive for the consumer, uh, which is largely parents and, and families. Um, so I would say that I've been trying to look at this holistically, and I'm having different conversations um, across <coughs> government. Um, I've had a very kind offer from the Social Justice Secretary to meet with her because we know that there is actually a, a huge issue with hidden nappy needs and families who just can't really afford and they're having to ration the nappies that they can access and that's resulting in a whole load of issues for babies and toddlers around health and well-being and hindering their development. But today I'm going to focus my remarks on the, the circular economy aspect of it. Um, and I would say, if I just jump to my other notes here, that single-use nappies being sent to landfill present a barrier to Scotland becoming a more circular nation. Um, but we know that alternatives are available. Um, and this is not about enforcing a product onto people, but creating more awareness and, and more choice. So sometimes they're referred to as cloth nappies, or reusable nappies or real nappies. Um, but we know that they are part of the solution. And the Scottish Government agrees because Scotland's baby box includes a voucher to allow families to try out reusable nappies. Um, and that um, now there's a QR code, it's quite easy to redeem. Um, you'll get to try a, a, a nappy you get the waterproof wrap and you get the, the liners with that as well. And that could be the first time that someone's ever seen or touched a reusable nappy. It might be the first time someone's heard of it. So the baby box is a really good vehicle. However, um, it's not enough because the uptake of that scheme um, has been quite static for the past few years and it's stuck around 13 to 14 per cent. And I know the Scottish Government wants to do more and there is the ambition to do more. Um, that's why I think these amendments are important. So the main one, which is 170, that's about the creation of a, a reusable nappy scheme. The amendments talk about diapers, and I'll apologise for that, because, again, no one really in Scotland talks about diapers. That was the advice I was given when I was drafting <laughs> the amendments by legislation team, and there's, there's good reason for that. But, again, I know that language can be a barrier, so I will talk about nappies today, uh, but I'm not contradicting what's in the, the amendments. Um, this is not my idea. I've not come up with this all by myself. It's because there's some really good practice in Scotland already. Um, colleagues on this committee know that I've talked about the North Ayrshire um, birth to potty scheme before. 
that was set up in 2019 um, as an environmental measure, but also as an anti-poverty measure. And that allows families to try um, reusable nappies, um, similar to the baby box scheme, but there's also an option too, which is birthday potty. And that allows families to get some advice from the local authority, from the waste prevention team. Um, and some families want to you know, live more sustainably. Others are motivated by trying to reduce their living costs. But ultimately, it's a non-judgmental service with advice from council officers and families can introduce reusable nappies and use them in a kind of a hybrid way alongside disposable nappies or use reusable all the time. Um, it's been operating since 2019. It was brought in by a Scottish Labour administration at the time, but it's continued under an SNP administration. And myself and um, Lorna Slater, um, Ms Martin's predecessor, we visited um, with Scottish Government officials, visited North Ayrshire recently to see that scheme in action, to hear from the officers who are rightly very proud of what they're achieving and to hear from um, a, a parent who's been using the scheme. Um, it's really successful and uh, there's a lot of demand for the scheme. The frustration that I have, therefore, is that since 2019, this really good work has been happening in, in North Ayrshire, but we haven't seen it roll out across the country. There are around four other councils that have a scheme of some sort, but it's not as comprehensive as North Ayrshire's. Um, and it just seems to me that there's just not enough awareness across Scotland about the opportunity um, of reusable nappy schemes. There is a reusable nappy awareness week that happens in April every year. But again, it's not something that's really been prominent in Scotland, but it is supported quite well in other parts of the, the UK. So I've been trying to understand why other councils haven't been doing it. And I think it's really coming down to just leadership. Um, I think you need people who are really passionate about reuse and understand some of these issues around nappies. Um, and just you need that that time and capacity within local authorities to share good practice. So the North Ayrshire visit really um, reinforced my view that we need to do something quite bold on this. Um, obviously, resources are tight and people are nervous that we ask council to take on work that might cost money. But this, this scheme is cost neutral because the council saves money on landfill. So I think it's over 67,000 um, kilograms of waste that's been um, diverted from landfill. So I'll just get that right. 62,250 kilograms of waste has been intercepted from landfill. And that's just North Ayrshire alone. Um, and there's much more that we could do. Alongside that, um, <coughs> I've looked at other parts of the public sector. Health boards are spending quite a lot of money on single-use nappies um, for maternity wards and, and uh, neonatal and other, other clinics as well. They've not been using um, reusable or real nappies, but I've had a conversation locally in NHS Lanarkshire, and now that they've had the idea put to them, they're actually, in terms of our efforts around net zero, reducing single-use plastics, we want to look at this and do something in this space. So again, it's trying to join the dots on this because we talk a lot about behaviour change, but we need to support people. Yeah, of course. I'm listening really closely to what you're saying about the NHS side of it, and I've, I personally didn't even think of that. When you're saying about reusable um, nappies that the, that the board has taken on, uh, is thinking of taking on, is that so that the nappy then follows the baby, so if the, 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 the parents could take him, take him home, or would they be reused within the NHS themselves? So it, it could actually be both. I mean, that's a really good question. So when um, the family are still in, in the hospital setting, um, if they need, often you're, you're told to bring in your own nappies anyway, but sometimes babies come early, circumstances don't allow for that. So hospitals always provide emergency supplies as they do with nursing pads and um, maternity pads and so on. Um, so if 
parents can see actually this is what a reusable nappy is and they might say oh I'm going to get that now from the baby box it just creates that awareness again it's not about saying that that's the only nappy you would be given um, but the, the, the NHS boards are spending the money already and it's about you know if we've got aims as a nation to be more circular um, and to try and do things differently then it's across the public sector how do we embed that but the point about laundry I mean obviously we've got you know obviously very high clinical standards around infection prevention control in our NHS settings but you know there's no reason why the, the, the nappies could be laundered and, and kept for, for the next baby that, that needs them. This is happening in our communities already, where at the nappy libraries, you know, pre-owned, pre-loved nappies are being passed on. And I was visiting a social enterprise the other day and you could pick up um, pre-owned real nappies for a couple of pounds with all the sort of a kit that you, you might need. But again, it's about taking the stigma out of that. Now, what's really encouraging is that Ms Slater commissioned some research um, on the barriers to the uptake of, of reusable nappies. I um, understand the government has a report coming to them from the James Hudson Institute. And again, it'll be interesting to see what that has, has uncovered. Um, it's a bit like the reusable PD product. Once people know that there's alternatives available, they might try them. But the reason why I think it's really important that local authorities um, can take a lead on this, and that's what 170 is about, is that one of the barriers is cost. So if you're buying the birthday party kit yourself, that could cost you a, it could cost you a couple hundred pounds or up to a couple hundred pounds as a family. So when, you know, Often families are thinking about, right, what other things do we have to buy? Loss of income is factored in because of maternity pay and things like that. It's maybe not a high priority, but because the council through procurement powers can buy at volume, um, I wouldn't maybe narrate the figures that North Asia gave me today, but I was quite surprised at the, the rate they're able to buy them for. And North Asia Council was saying, actually, if more councils were doing this, think about some of the potential savings yeah, of course. I thank Monica for taking the intervention because there's a few sort of questions I had around the, the amendments uh, um, she was bringing forward today. On, on 170, I'm thinking about um, local authorities, and you know they are. Let's let's face it; they're all struggling for every every you know yeah. every pound a prisoner just now in, in local authorities. So you know the first question I had was in terms of the scheme around North Ayrshire. Was there any more data, results, some of the costs that could be shared with us ahead of, sort of stage three? Is that there already? Because I presume the government must have a lot of that workings already, or is that going to be in that report you were talking about from the, the James Hutton uh, Institute? Around the, um, because you know you said it was land, um, it was cost neutral because yeah. 67,000, um, I presume tons was getting not going to, to landfill anymore, but in terms of landfill is is no longer able to be used for, for most waste anyway. So I'm not sure how if that's still relevant or if that's changed um and you know since that was the that figures were first put together. In terms of the um uh, one five seven in terms of the uh, the, the health care, has there been any more feedback from them? Because I, I would I would see I could see potential and I don't want to sound negative, I see potential problems around you know, okay. Uh, you know, new parents might pick up a, a reusable. I'm going to call them nappies, not a diaper. <laughs> um, they pick up a reusable, but then what, what do they do with it? You know, it is if there's not a facility there, do they have to then take that soiled nappy home and then they will maybe reuse it? So I, I can see issues here, and I would like to see more working with the Scottish government to see if there was sort of potential there. Because um, the last thing we want to do just now, I think, is put more costs on local authorities and health boards when they're when they're when they're struggling for cash. Um, okay, no, thanks for that. So, in terms of North Ayrshire, um, the authority has been quite clear that the scheme operates cost neutral. It has done from the beginning, and it continues to be cost neutral. So, it's not cost them any extra money to do it. So, yes, they're buying in the the nappy kits to distribute to families. And again, it's any family who lives in North Ayrshire um, is, is eligible who needs uh, the use of, of nappies. And as you say, this is for babies and, and toddlers. Um, they have said, because of commercial confidentiality, 
they can't publish um, the, 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 the amount that they're charged at the gate for for their landfill waste and I think that would be the same for every council they're not going to give those figures but I've got no reason to disbelieve North Ayrshire when they say it's costs um, neutral and they actually say that they think there's potential for, for more savings to be made I think just while I'm on 170 I also wanted to say I think this does also relate to discussions we've had about litter about fly tipping because um, when I was starting to work on this, I was thinking very much about trying to, you know, uh, reduce the number of nappies that go to landfill and to encourage um, the use of, of alternatives. But nappies are such a problem like in our communities as well, because we do see them in, in bins in the park. We see them sometimes at the beach. We see them in, in, in the countryside and... I was thinking in terms of my discussions with COSLA that, you know, in terms of trying to reduce antisocial behaviour um, and reduce litter, you know, maybe nappies are not one of the top five issues, but they are one of the items that also gets disposed of in an irresponsible way. I had an issue recently where a local councillor in my area was talking about a new housing area that's been opened up um, with a mixture of, of public and, and private sector housing. And the houses are beautiful, but someone stuck a nappy down the toilet and blocked the drains. So, again, there's a big opportunity around education and, and awareness. Um, so, the, the, the point about the, the health boards here, um, I don't want to... You know, I want to keep this really simple. It's really just about saying health boards already are spending money on nappies. The data that I have shows that none of that spend is on reusable items. It's all on single-use items. So if there was a way that local authorities, you know, could have a policy or a scheme, sorry, health boards have a policy or a scheme where they start to shift some of that spend to reusable, it just creates that awareness. And I'm thinking about hospitals, but that's also about health visitors and midwives and the community as well. It just creates that visibility and that conversation because um, we're ultimately trying to get that behaviour change. Um, it has to be about choice. You know, I would not be sitting here saying parents must do this or enforcing a certain kind of nappy onto parents, especially when they've just given birth or they're in the hospital if a wee one is, is unwell. But alongside the baby box, we need to do more. That's why I think 157 and 170 together, it starts to create that system change that will lead to individual behaviour change. Yeah, of course, from James Simpson. Uh, thanks for taking the intervention. Um, I mean, Monica mentions the word choice, and just reflecting on these these, these amendments, you know, one one seventy and, and one five seven. Does she not think that it should be a matter of choice for health boards and councils whether they um, introduce the schemes that she is su suggesting? Uh, and clearly, North Ayrshire have made that choice, and they they say it's cost neutral, but I don't think the committee has had the evidence of that. Um, I think uh, we would need to see that evidence before sort of deciding that it actually was cost neutral, because I would imagine that there would be several councils that would conclude that it, it, it is not cost neutral, uh, and similarly uh, with health boards. Um, so I just wonder, you know, would she accept that general point that it should be a, a local decision rather than something that's set down in law? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few interesting points here from, from Graeme Simpson. Um, what I would say is that, you know, absolutely do believe that we need a partnership approach and a collaborative approach to circular economy, you know, work full stop. That's why I support the government's intent to have genuine co-production and working together, you know, and that's not just about local authorities and health boards, uh, and regulators. That's about working with our communities and working with the third sector. That was a central theme in this committee's net zero inquiry from, from some time ago. So what I would say is I'm identifying some excellent practice here, which happens to be North Ayrshire. I have no reason to disbelieve North Ayrshire when they say repeatedly it's cost neutral. Um, and I'm just going to leave that there. Um, 
There are examples I've mentioned before, I think I mentioned some of it last week, around the Ayrshire Nappy Library, the Lanarkshire Real Nappy uh, project, which is in the region that Mr Simpson and I uh, represent together. So I would encourage Mr Simpson to get along to Swaddle to meet some of the, the parents who run that. But they're looking for more support from local authorities, from health boards, frankly, from the government as well. And I don't accept it. We just leave it to local authorities if they feel like doing something or they think it's important because we're in a climate and nature emergency. We need urgent action. I'm identifying something that's been going on in North Ayrshire since 2019 and there's a less than a handful of other councils doing something in this space around reusable nappies. I think it is really, really um, important because on average, a child before the age of two and a half is using 5,000 nappies. That's for each individual child. So I think it's a substantial issue. And in the UK, the Nappy Alliance estimate that three billion disposable nappies um, a year are going to landfill and the cost to local authorities, this is for the UK, is more than £60 million pounds a year for disposal. So if you think about the cost to Scotland, it is absolutely substantial. So again, I welcome the fact, and I think it is quite unusual, um, but to be welcomed that the Scottish Government went with me on a fact-finding mission to North Ayrshire, but it all seems to be happening, uh, to speak about that scheme, to learn from that. There's the research government's commissions. There's a commitment to, um, you know, include this in the route map. But my um, appeal to the committee and to government is that we need to do more. So I welcome the conversations I've had with Ms Martins and she took up posts. I think there's more conversation we need to have, but... Um, I've, there's been no objection from COSLA. I continue to have discussions with COSLA. They're really keen to understand fully how this can benefit local authorities because there will be concerns about capacity, expertise and know-how because not every council will have a team of waste awareness officers the way that North Ayrshire does. It's an investment that they obviously feel works for them. But there's opportunities for local authorities to work together um, so it just feels that we have to do more. Um, on the other amendment in this group, um, which I've now lost my page, this was about uh, reporting on access to usable nappies. That was 158. So hopefully that one is, is, is straightforward. <laughs> I've got different amendments that are not about nappies. So if there's any more questions on the nappies, I could take that now and then I can move on to the other. It's, it's, that's not quite how it works, but, yep. but, but the point taken is that you... Uh, I was inviting interventions on nappies, but if not, then I can move on. Well, there may be interventions already stacked up, Ms Lennon, so, so I'm okay. just looking around to see if there's any committee members who want to say anything. No, there aren't, but I know that Maurice Golden does, so uh, do you want to come in? Yeah, I think that it, it's slightly concerning, and this is no... Uh, commentary on the amendments in particular, but it's concerning that we're discussing this 20 years on from when we discussed it last time. Uh, very circular, and that's that's a problem of, of government and potentially parliament that we're we're discussing essentially a real nappy campaign almost 20 years after it was. Um, put in the landfill, so to speak. But I think there's, there's an opportunity for the Scottish Government to really provide Parliament and the member with information around um, the policy choices in this space. So we've had a real nappy campaign before, funded by the Scottish Government. The information contained in that, the results in terms of how it changed behaviour, how effective it was, the materials provided could all be published, that that would be really useful. Indeed, as, as Mark Ruskell mentioned previously, we've had absorbent hygiene product uh, recycling trials. Now, they don't just include nappies, they um, uh, include other products. Again, that report being published would be really useful in terms of this space of uh, debate. I hope the Scottish Government would do that. There's also been life cycle analysis over um, the 
environmental impact of real nappies versus uh, disposable ones and the requirements in which you might need to launder your um, reusable nappy to make it better for the environment. Again, that's another re report that the, the Scottish Government could put in place. Um, the other policy options I think that should be considered in the round is it could be a ban on absor absorbent hygiene products going to landfill. That might be another option that the Scottish Government may want to pursue. Um, it doesn't mean that you couldn't pursue the thrust of uh, Ms Lennon's amendments. And um, uh, furthermore, there are increasingly uh, biodegradable nappies uh, coming on the, the market. And of course, they would be uh, banned from going to landfill. Again, the analysis, the sales analysis over how that is, is, is working out would be really useful uh, in advance of stage three so that members can make an evidence-based choice on, on the policy interventions in this, in this area. And I think that would be incredibly uh, helpful. I think that the, uh, particularly 170, the scheme for reusable diapers, as it's, as it's called, I think without knowing the round of this space, it's actually difficult to know on an evidence base says whether to support this or not. It may be the best policy option, but it may not be. Um, and uh, similarly, on donated mattresses, I think the way the amendment does 216 is set out, it could be incredibly burdensome on local authorities working out different databases to match up, although the intention is, is, is obviously uh, um, important. Yes. If it's okay, can I maybe speak to 216 first of all, yeah. and then just so I can okay. set the context for that, but that, I really appreciate that. Um, okay. Because in a, a, a little uh, tangle here is that the way it works, just to remind members, is you speak to all your amendments in the group and then other members will come in. You can't invite halfway through your uh, speech on some of the amendments, interventions on those, and then come back to other amendments afterwards. Now that we've clarified that, <laughs> and Monica, on the basis that I'm sure you misunderstood that genuinely, I'm going to ask you to speak to the other amendments in your group and then I will come to the Minister if there are no other interventions, and then I will come back to you to wind up. So I think you haven't talked on mattresses yeah. um, and such like, so, and reusable uh, bottles, I think, was the other one. Okay. But I'll let you speak to those, if I may, and then come to the Minister. <laughs> Thank you, I do apologise. I was trying to be helpful, and I've now been unhelpful, so I do apologise um, for that. So I'll speak about uh, the reason that reusable nappy points um, at the end. Um, in terms of um, 159, which is the, the water uh, bottles, uh, just give me one moment. Right, so 159 would have the effect of providing every school pupil in Scotland with a free refillable bottle made from sustainable materials. Um, I think colleagues will remember Callum Eistead who made history uh, when he came to Parliament as a seven-year-old to speak to his petition at the System Participation and Public Petitions Committee. That was petition PE1896. So Callum very successfully um, campaigned within his school uh, to put an end to single-use plastic bottles. So schools, local authorities have a duty to provide drinking water and make that available to children during the school day. But Callum did the sums and worked out that his school was sending a lot of single-use plastic in the form of drinking bottles um, to, to landfill every, every week. Um, he managed to change the policy within school, but wanted to solve this at a, a Scotland-wide level. So the petition is still being considered by the Parliament. Um, Callum is now nine, so he is growing up fast. He did have a meeting with former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, but the campaign in terms of momentum really hasn't gone anywhere quickly enough. Um, and I think it's absolutely um, a brilliant idea. So again, we talk a lot about charges uh, and sticks in this committee in the context of the circular economy. This is about incentives and, and carrots and, and giving young people um, 
op opportunities. Yes, of course. For giving way, I'm sure Monica Lynn is aware that there are lots of good practice in this front already, where uh, reusable water bottles are, are, are given out in quite significant quantities within education uh, establishments. However, um, speaking as a, as a father, I, I know I've got, I've got a son of eight, and we've got a cupboard full of reusable bottles. And I'm sure when my son starts school for primary four, he want the latest reusable bottle because there's fashions and trends and everything else in relation to this. It became quite fashionable, fashionable to have reusable bottles, but because of that, young people are collecting several bottles on latest trend. Is there a wider issue about trying to encourage a culture change where we have one reusable bottle because it's self-defeating to have ten reusable bottles in a cupboard? And I'm probably confessing something about my, my, my home life there, Miss Lennon. I think it's a really good point from Bob Doris, and it's similar to the challenges we have around fast fashion, where you know we're trying to create a culture shift to slow fashion. And coming back to, I mean, I know Graham Simpson's a big fan of pre-love clothing. He's talked about it in the chamber before. I'm not sure if he's wearing something circular today, but so there's things that we can do individually. But then it's about having the right systems. Um, so how do we create an environment in our schools where? it becomes normalised that we've got bottles that are made more sustainable practice. I think Callum talks about metal bottles in particular. Um, but you might have the facility then to, to wash it out properly. I think an issue can be that sometimes the children feel they can't wash it properly in school or don't have the access to do that. So hopefully it speaks for itself. Again, it's not my idea. This is a really important idea that came from... You know, Callum, when he was seven years old and he came to this parliament, um, I know he continues to get support from Sue Webber as one of his local MSPs. Um, I, I read that he felt a bit disappointed after he met with um, former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon that he felt that nothing had really happened. And I'm just reflecting on the many young people that we've heard at this committee, uh, whether it's MSYPs um, or other young people that have been involved in citizens' panels. Um, they want to know when they bring good ideas that something actually happens. Yeah, of course. Uh, can I thank Monica Lennon for taking the intervention. Um, just, just to build on the point that Bob Doris made, I think he's not the only one who has uh, a lot of uh, these you know, refillable bottles in cupboards. That's, that's just what happens. People collect them. Is there a danger that by actually issuing more of them, you add to the landfill problem, because at some point, Mr. Doris and, and you know, people like him may just have a clear out. And, you know, so the, 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 bo the bottles end up in the bin. And, you know, and I think, I think the point uh, that, that he made uh, about sort of fa fashion trends and youngsters not wanting to use particular bottles, even if they're given them, is, is a strong one. And I just wonder whether you accept any of that. And also, have you um, assessed what the cost of this would be? So what I would say is that these ideas are coming straight from the classroom. They're coming from young people in Scotland. You know, Callum Eisted has a lot of support for his proposition. Um, not just from environmental groups, but from young people themselves. And when you visit any school, you speak to any eco committee, they are so passionate about being change makers. And they get a bit frustrated with people like us, the politicians, because they know the science, they know the actions required, they don't see the system change happening quickly enough. And that is on us. I think a conversation. Um, needs to be had around some of the procurement opportunities, but our schools are really well placed to do this in a joined up way, looking at what's in the curriculum already around climate, around nature, around sustainability. Learning for sustainability is obviously um, a national um, endeavour. Um, but it's something that I think if we listen and learn, we can learn something from Scotland's young people on this. Um, it's maybe to Morris Golden's point about nappies. If we're sitting here in 20 years' time and someone's saying, why are we not routinely using refillable, reusable bottles? Oh, there was a conversation in Parliament about that 20 years ago. Um, I think it's also an important part of reducing the cost of the school day. There's a lot of pressure 
on families, you know, to buy every year the new school bag, the new lunchbox, the new water bottle of the latest theme. That's very much part of the, uh, the fast fashion. It's an extension of that, I would say, to Bob Doris. So schools are working really, really hard to reduce the cost of the school day. I see this sitting very much in that space, but absolutely is, is highly relevant to becoming um, a more circular economy. And then on Amendment 216, which um, Maurice Golden already kindly mentioned, again, people are going to think I'm on commission by North Ayrshire Council, but when I was down visiting them and in anticipation of that meeting, um, I found out that they uh, um, operate this scheme um, which tackles this issue of problem mattresses. Um, so Zero Waste Scotland, and this is 2019, so these figures are maybe a little bit out of date, but in 2019, Zero Waste Scotland estimated that over 600,000 mattresses are sent to landfill in Scotland. Um, what they're doing in North Ayrshire is the council's partnering with a local charity and they uplift um, used or donated mattresses. They're completely sanitised so they can be redistributed um, and you know have a, have a second life and again I think we all know from our local areas particularly in, in quite urban areas where mattresses can be a bit of a problem just dumped on the on the street and in, in other places so, yeah okay. I, I will make reference to to that about dumped mattresses and other mm -hmm. items under the section of Code of Practice and Household Waste Recycling in relation to bulk uplift charges. Mm -hmm. But, however, in, in relation to the amendment that, that you have at 216, Ms Lennon, I'm just wondering, one way to avoid a, a bulk uplift charge for a mattress, of course, is to phone the council and say, come and uh, reuse, recycle, repurpose my mattress. The mattress may, may be done, gone, beyond repair, and it's just p at the end of life, and people just use that to circumvent um, local authority charges. Is that a risk or can, is no mattress so far gone that it can't be repurposed, reused, recycled for a free uplift? But can you just confirm that the intention would be any mattress uplifted free of charge by any local authority if this was to pass? Um, so the amendment 216 is for local authorities to make a scheme for their area to provide access to donated mattresses. Um, Again, drawing on an example from North Ayrshire, there obviously is a process in terms of, you know, any repairs, safety checks, the sanitisation. So if it's just not possible um, or, um, you know, hygienic to reuse a mattress, there'll be circumstances where it's just not possible, then obviously there isn't going to be the enforced use of that, that mattress. But hopefully the way it's drafted um, provides enough flexibility. But again, I appreciate it's maybe quite a novel idea and I haven't had time to discuss this one with the Minister because we did talk at length about other other uh, matters but again if it's not something that could be put into the legislation on the face of the bill again where we have good practice already happening how can we learn from that because North Asia again have identified uh, an issue um, both environmentally and socially. And again, it's where we have these solutions. How can we support local authorities and other partners? To... Yep. Sorry, before we go on, can I just say that uh, I, I am beseeching members to understand the difficult position that I find I, I am in at the moment. So far, we have spent 38 minutes on this first group of amendments discussing them. I absolutely understand the need uh, for, to debate open, honestly, that is the point of stage two. And I understand people's passions involved in each of the areas. We all have passions and we all have things that we want to achieve in the circular economy bill. But <clears throat> there are deadlines, although in the parliamentary procedure they are quite loose. Uh, I, I am very flexible to work till 10, 12 o'clock at night, if, if that is what the committee would like, would like to do to get through these amendments. So just asking members, please, to bear in mind everyone's passions on each stage of this and make sure that they can, where possible, ask crisp and concise questions and, and for members to give 
crisp and concise speeches on the matters they feel important about. I will not say this again because I've said it twice now and I'm very happy to work every hour that the Parliament wants to, make, to ask me to work to get these amendments through but it may not suit everyone else uh, to do so and uh, I guess that I'm formally saying at this stage this session will probably go on to 1.30 quarter to two today fair warning and may have to extend into evenings uh, next week to get through um, so I've said my piece uh, I promise I won't say it again I apologize if I've offended anyone it's not the aim Douglas if you'd like to come in and Monica to respond Quite a crisp question uh, just ask Monica Lennon so in terms of a lot of these um, amendments you, you're, you have in this group are about best practice it's, can COSLA not bring that forward in, instead of having it in the legislation I think that's a fair question and I can't speak for COSLA. The conversations that we've had together have been really positive. Um, they haven't expressed, um, on the nappies, it's primarily been the nappies that I've discussed it with them, they haven't expressed any um, opposition to that. Um, again, I was surprised to kind of hear from them that they didn't really know about the North Ayrshire scheme either. So there's something here that I think we all need to take away about collaboration and good practice not really being um, spotlighted uh, enough. Um, I haven't had time to speak to them about the, 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 the mattress scheme um, or the, the reusable uh, water bottles, but there's been a lot of attention given to the reusable bottles in the, the, the other committee that I mentioned. There's a lot on the record um, about that. Um, but I think the comments about what more could local authorities do is a fair one. Um, that's why sometimes it's frustrating that everyone waits to see what legislation is going to do and then we talk about, oh, actually, don't do legislation, have it in a plan or a strategy. I've noticed that Mr Swinney said that maybe we need less strategy and more action. But I will leave it there in the interest of everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, yes, we're now going to go to the open debate, which I feel we may have had already, but, Mark, you'd like to come in. Yeah, thanks very much. And, you know, thanks to Monica Lennon for championing you know, a range of different really important approaches here that, that are being driven by communities and social enterprises. And I think particularly you know, the work that's happening uh, on nappies around Scotland, some of it which has been happening for the last 20 years, is really valuable. And I think there's, there's, there's certainly more that can be done uh, to promote uh, best practice and to ensure that it's rolled out across different councils. Um, but I think, you know, Morris Gold makes an important point here, which is that, you know, we have had 20 years, particularly on, on nappies. Um, we have had, had evidence being brought forward as to what is the most effective way forward to reduce waste and to treat the inevitable waste that we're going to continue to get from disposable nappies. Um, and we've also had evidence on, you know, what, what is driving behavioural change, what, what the barriers are to that as well. So I think it's really important that government reflects on all of that. And I do think the most appropriate way to take forward uh, the work on reusables is through the route map, which I think is where the discussion with uh, Monica and, and, and Lorna Slater kind of, kind of got to. Um, I do think, though, that social enterprises are doing incredible work. And, you know, we've got some good examples here from, you know, nappies, mattresses. Um, that, that are being lodged as specific amendments. I mean, we could, you could lodge a whole range of other amendments here as well. I would, I would highlight bikes as being massively important where you've got social enterprises that are taking bikes out of landfill, doing them up, uh, selling them on, uh, generating skills and training, um, then those bikes being used in schools for bikeability training. So, you know, there, there, there are lots of examples, furniture as well being another one. I think the question is what, what is appropriate within this bill? Um, and although I'm kind of reassured by some of the comments that previous ministers made about the route map, I, I am wondering ahead of stage three whether there is an appropriate kind of anchor in this bill that, that ensures that local authorities and government are doing the planning around reusable items. And I, and I, don't, I don't have cl clarity in my own head about what that might look like at this point. I, I, I don't think it's the amendments that, that are before us from Monica Lennon, but I do think there's something in there around having certainty that local authorities are, are carrying out appropriate planning on reusable items. And I, and I guess that, 
that for me is part of the discussion now uh, with what time we've got between stage two and stage three about what may be appropriate within this bill. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Minister, I now call on you. Thank you, convener. Um, I would want to quote Ms Lennon back. <laughs> when we have good practice, um, how can we support local authorities to replicate it? And I think that gets to the nub of what these uh, amendments, the, the debate that we've just, just had. I think we all agree that um, the, the substance behind Ms Lennon's amendments is laudable. I'm supportive of their intent. Um, but we've had a conversation uh, uh, together and she, she knows that I won't be able to support them as, as they're written because I want the co-design process uh, to be the vehicle for these decisions at local authority level. And sharing that good practice, it, it's absolutely vital. Um, the improve, there's an improvement programme under co uh, development with COSLA and local government. Um, and that's going to offer a practical route to share best practice on waste prevention measures, including reuse alongside recycling. And I think the fact that we've had this debate today and, and Ms Lennon's efforts in getting this uh, attention to this issue will mean that any, any co-design around this will have to look at this, this issue, particularly on, on nappies. Um, I mean, as, as somebody that has raised two babies myself, um, I was, I've, I've been reflecting on why I didn't go down that route, what it was. And of course, the government um, has commissioned that research as well to look at the barriers, because I think that's also at the nub of this as well. Is there a, a perception out there that it, they are too expensive? Is there a perception out there that um, it's going to be increased workload for an already struggling young, young mum? Um, whatever that research, and it'll be in the next couple of weeks that comes, comes out, as has been mentioned as well. We've had a really good debate. Um, the question is how to engender knowledge sharing and prompt similar schemes to happen across Scotland without taking uh, that empowerment away from local authorities with a top-down approach. I mean, I would be delighted if local authorities across Scotland replicated the North Ayrshire scheme. It sounds incredible, um, and I, I pay tribute to them. Um, I, and and uh, I'm happy to consider how we can support and encourage behaviour change in this area um, and, and the rollout of this type of scheme and then to encourage that co-design. But it must be for local authorities to make those decisions. And I think Ms Lennon has alluded to that as well. We've already included a commitment within our draft route map to facilitate sharing of best practice in reusable nappy schemes and to support take-up across Scotland. It's good to hear Ms Lennon is also speaking to um, uh, Shirley Ann Somerville around what can be more can be done in the, in the baby box. Um, the committee also agreed Amendment 138, which regards, requires having regard to behavioural change in the development of the circular economy strategy. If there's anything that could strengthen that aspect of the strategy or the co-design process, I'm happy to work with Ms Lennon on that and I've made that offer to her. You know, what has got to be taken into account in, in this co-design process? Um, and, and Ms Lennon also made a very interesting point on the voices of those in communities being taken into account in that co-design process. Are the voices of new parents? going to be included in that, you know? Um, is there maybe some, some unconscious bias in the decisions that I've been making around policies here? And we had a, an interesting conversation on that last week uh, in private. Um, as regard Amendment 158, we don't need legislation to prepare uh, the report that Ms Lennon puts forward. The committee is aware we're shortly due to publish baseline research into barriers uh, to the uptake of reusable nappies in Scotland. Yes. Just on uh, reporting which the Minister mentions, I, I wonder if the Minister will commit to previous reports around uh, nappies, absorbent hygiene products that have been produced that currently aren't published that would benefit both Parliament and help to inform the debate. Happy to look into that, Mr Gordon. Thanks. Um, as regard Amendment 159, provision of food and drinks, again as a matter for local authorities, um, you know, I, I, like the reusable nappies amendment, I regard this amendment as a detail that would restrict local decision making. But I think that Cameron Eisted drew much needed attention to the issue in schools. I know that a lot of schools in my in my area, you know, that, that, that they have their own individual policies that have been co-designed with the, like. like equal committees in, in primary schools and in secondary schools as well. Um, and I, I think that less and less we're seeing in, um, sort of single-use drinks containers being used in schools as a result of, very much as a result of, of, of the work that uh, uh, Callum, I said, drew attention to. Um, yes? 
Min, um, and I'm grateful for all the comments she's made so far. Um, we know that only six local authorities have said that they would be um, interested in setting up to a national procurement scheme around making refillable or reusable bottles available, but with the caveat that the funding would have to come from the Scottish Government. So is that not a, a, a general challenge that we have where some of the good practice that we would like to see and expect to see is not happening because of expectations around funding? And I think that the, the mindset around where savings can actually be made and where you can get to cost neutral as well, that's not something that's really been properly looked at. So th that point about um, a national procurement scheme, which I think was well made, um, but the appetite doesn't seem to be there. Um, or there is an appetite, but the funding would have to follow. Well, I think this the improvement uh, programme that I mentioned is a, is a vehicle and a confidential vehicle for those conversations to be happening. And Ms Lennon, for example, if I go back to the, the reusable nappies argument about the cost neutrality of existing schemes, and you know they don't want to publish that information for the reasons that, 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 that Ms Lennon put out, but it, it enabled those conversations to happen local authority to local authority, and for the case to be made about why it is cost neutral. But Ms Lennon also makes a, a great point about the more local authorities get involved in this scheme, then the cost will actually come down as well. Um, I, I just want, want to say that uh, in, in regard to the Mattresses Amendment uh, 216, um, I understand the reasons why there um, is an interest in such a, our approach to mattresses. The Scottish Government is already committed to taking further steps to tackle the environmental impact of items such as uh, mattresses. Um, our draft Waste and Circular Economy route map highlighted the potential for mattresses to be included as a priority in a future stewardship plan. Again, it's useful to have this discussion, though, because there are, there are uh, companies who sell mattresses who operate a take-back of old mattress uh, provision. When you buy one, then you know that your other mattress that you don't use anymore is going to be taken back from them. Um, and I certainly, uh, recently, when, when I was buying a mattress, I looked for companies who did that because it took away the, the hassle frankly, but also I looked into what they were going to be doing with the old mattress as well. So there's a commercial aspect to this for, for, for those companies as well. So it's a useful conversation to have. Um, I've mentioned in previous sessions it's vital that we take the necessary time to engage effectively in co-design of the new code of practice for household waste in order to understand what new reuse and recycling services most benefit householders and to consider what's feasible and affordable for local authorities, but allow them to make those decisions as well. Um, I'd ask uh, Ms Lennon not to press them, but certainly uh, we've had a discussion in private around what we can maybe be doing around what we might put in place as part of that co-design process. Uh, to engender those types of decisions and that knowledge sharing that has been expressed today. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, Minister. And I call on Monica Lennon to wind up and uh, the press will withdraw Amendment 157. Monica. Um, thank you, Convener. And I'm grateful to the Minister and all colleagues who have taken part in, in this debate. Um, I'm really glad to hear the Minister say that, that she supports the intention behind the amendments um, and that they are laudable. Um, you know, we have had a good conversation when we met last week and I think we can continue to work together and have dialogue ahead of stage three. I think many important points and questions have been raised today and I'll go away and reflect on that too. So I think we, we can ha perhaps... Um, think about a form of wording that might that might satisfy everyone for for, for stage three. Um, you know, I'm grateful to colleagues' time because I know this section has been on longer than the convener would have liked. But I think it's important that we've had this debate now because hopefully we'll be in a much clearer position for, for stage three. But the reason why I spent so much time, not just today, but in the build up to, to stage two, working on the reusable nappy amendments is because of the impact that nappies have on our environment and if we do want to have you know a circular economy bill that's worthy of the name then we have to look at items 
that have you know the biggest impact so i think it's been proportionate to spend a bit of time on this today like others including morris golden i want to see the pace um quick in here you know these are not new conversations you know my almost 18 year old daughter you know had a uh, you know she had a, a cloth bum as we say so we use real nappies in our house and that's that's quite a long time ago now um but i feel like sometimes we're talking about it as if it's a brand new uh, idea and you're having to explain what it is so there's something in that uh, and that's why i will take up the offer to meet with shirley and somerville to talk about the baby box and what more we can do um, so I think, yes, proportionality, this is a, an item that has a huge impact. Pace, we're not seeing enough happen. And partnership, you know, we've heard about some local authorities who are doing excellent work and some work in this space, but the work in our communities, whether that's led through social enterprises or just a small group of mums coming together as they do in Ayrshire on a Friday to provide that peer-to-peer -peer support. Um, so I will... Um, not be moving the amendments or pressing them today, but I'll continue to speak, um, hopefully with the government and other colleagues, and continue discussions with COSLA. Yes, I will, Jackie. Um, very quickly, um, you called it a cloth ball, I call it a hippin. Um, <laughs> but uh, would you agree with me that there's absolutely nothing wrong with going back in time to ensure that the future for our young ones are preserved? I, mean, I think it's really important. I mean, I know today we're trying to focus our remarks on circular economy mm. and how we become a more circular Scotland. But as I've said earlier on, and I'll try and keep this very brief, I can see that the, pen, <laughs> the pen's almost... Uh, no, no. You've not missed that. So it's, it's looking at this holistically, because we're often accused yeah. in Parliament and Government of working in silos, and I really, really don't want us to look at this in a siloed way. Um, I think it's absolutely an issue around gender equality as well. And maybe if we had more women and mothers in decision-making positions, we would have had these policies in place a long time ago and this would just be a normal, a normal thing. But as I said, there's a, there's a poverty dimension to this yeah. and a welfare issue. Um, there's a charity that operates um, here in Edinburgh and, and they uh, take donations of nappies get them out to people who need them. I mean, I went to visit them. Um, a health visitor had come in and they were taking a bundle of nappies away to a young mum uh, in this city who was sitting at home with not very much. And the, the conversation was about wee babies having, having nappy rash uh, and things like that. Um, babies and toddlers who don't ever get to go swimming because parents are saying we can't afford these swimming nappies. And it's just having that conversation, letting people know what's available. So I'll continue to be really passionate about it and talk about it way more than anyone would like. But I genuinely, you know, I'm grateful to to the Minister and the government for the time they've spent on this already. You know, that, that visit to North Ayrshire was really worthwhile. I look forward to seeing the, the report from the James Hutton Institute that talks on some of these barriers and hopefully have something that's much more uh, fit for purpose for stage three. Thank you, Ms. Lennon. Can you just confirm whether you want to press or withdraw Amendment 157? Um, withdraw 157. Thank you. Uh, Monica Lennon wishes to withdraw Amendment 157. Does any member wish to object to with the amendment being withdrawn? They don't. So I now call Amendment 158 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 157. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 159 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 157. Monica Lennon to move or not moved. I uh, therefore call Amendment 216 in the name of Monica Lennon, already debated with Amendment 157. And Monica Lennon to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Um, right, uh, we're now going to uh, call Amendments... Um, 129 in the name of Jackie Dunbar Group with amendments 36, 37, 38, 130, one, uh, sorry, 39 and 44. Jackie Dunbar, can you move amendment 129 and speak to the amendments in the group? 
Thank you, Convener. Um, my speech will be like me, short and sweet, as I take on your points about being crisp and concise, and I do realise that we are behind schedule regarding time. With that in mind, I have lodged Amendments 129 and 130, and will speak to only them in the group. Amendment 129 states, for the purposes of subsection 2, an occupier of domestic property may request from an authorised person a copy of any documentation or identification that authorises the authorised person to transfer household waste. And Amendment 130 states that it is a reasonable excuse for a person given a notice under subsection 2 to show a constable or an authorised officer any documentation or identification obtained from an authorised person to transfer household waste. Um, I intend to speak to these together and not separately, as Amendment 130 does not work without Amendment 129, and hopefully they are self-explanatory. Convener, I chose to lodge these as proben amendments in response to the evidence we took during Stage 1. It became clear to me that when reasonable steps were discussed, it was not as helpful to the occupier nor the authorised persons when dealing with the disposal of goods as I had hoped it would be. Uh, what is reasonable for one does not mean a reasonable to another, and who chooses what reasonable is. My aim with these amendments is to strengthen the confidence of the occupier and that the persons they are seeking to obtain the service from can prove they are authorised to do so. And following that, should the occupier find that their goods were not disposed of in a fit and proper manner, then they could provide evidence to the constable or authorised officer that they took reasonable steps to ensure that they had done due diligence by obtaining a copy of the documentation or identification obtained from the person that they had contracted to transfer their household waste. This would have the knock-on effect that in that it would perhaps show the officer who was responsible for who, who was responsible for flight up and for example. As I said, I lodged these as proben amendments, and with that in mind, I look forward to hearing the minister's thoughts on the amendments I have I have moved today. Thank you very much. I now call on Morris Golden to speak to Amendment 36 and any other amendments in the group. Morris. Uh, thank you, convener. Just to cover off uh, Jackie Dunbar's uh, amendments, uh, my understanding would be that that is exactly the current case in terms of having to produce a waste carrier's licence. In the case of special waste, there should be pre-notification for things like fridges and other um, designated carriers. Um, I think I accept the probing amendments. Perhaps there's some work around an enhanced duty of care and awareness raising for both householders and indeed it could be a receptionist or other person um, um, who regularly liaises with waste carriers. There's probably quite a lot of work to do on that and perhaps um, it, uh, as part of that, that's something that, that, that should be looked at. Um, with regards to my amendments in this section, I think it might be helpful just to um, explain where I'm coming from in terms of bin fines. Um, my concern is that bin fines are a red herring, a, a rabbit hole, in order to uh, avoid us taking meaningful action on the circular economy. But nonetheless, um, I, I pose of a series of steps of how a local authority might impose a bin fine, and I hope that provides the clarity over the amendments which I've submitted. So, uh, the first step is there should be an efficient uh, curbside system with appropriate bring facilities um, uh, associated with that. There should be regular and consistent communications with householders over what can go in which bin and when. There should be bespoke interventions carried out by waste awareness officers um, and indeed consistent uh, contamination uh, guidance and, and checking from waste operatives. And where a household is identified, then the local authority should work with them uh, initially, it might just be around education, but there could be alternatives such as larger bins um, for young families, uh, for example, or there could be specific spatial is issues that are uh, causing the householder not to do it. Now, if all those have been carried out, and I'd be 
shocked if every local authority in Scotland is carrying out all those aspects, which I would describe as best practice. If all of these aspects have been uh, adhered to, then I think you might be in the space of bin fines. But I gently suggest to the committee that if you get to that final step, that uh, imposing a bin fine on the householder is likely to be unsuccessful. Happy to. Um, Morris Golden, you said that sometimes fam young families, people with young children, might need a, a, a larger bin. I just wondered what has been your um, understanding of that, the reasons for that? We're back to nappies again. <laughs> That's generally okay. due to... But I, I don't want to reopen that up, yeah. convener, but, but that is one of the main drivers for a larger residual bin. Um, so, um, I, in, in terms of all those reasons, that's why we have the suite of uh, amendments before us um, today. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much. Uh, just looking around the committee, I, I have a couple of points I would like to make, which I'd ask the members to sum up, uh, or certainly Jackie to sum up with when she comes, comes to the end. One of the issues that we heard about collection of household waste was the ease of, of getting a certificate off the uh, website, which just takes a matter of moments with no, with no due diligence. And also the issue that we heard about was whether it was important that those licensed collectors using a vehicle should display their license on the side of the vehicle, which would then automatically allow householders to see it and for people uh, following them up uh, to ascertain whether they have a license. So I wondered if the member had considered uh, that and maybe she could make reference to that in the conclusion. Uh, the other bit was on the bin fine. Um, we heard about the problems with bin fines and the bin police uh, uh, in, in the sense of, especially where bins are used by multiple residents um, and how that happens, especially in Edinburgh. But for example, as silly as this may seem, the bins I have at home all have to be locked uh, because people just put stuff in them because they're adjacent to the road. So it is very difficult. So every single bin has a padlock on it, uh, which seems ludicrous that you have to lock your rubbish. So I don't know if the minister's reflected on that, but I'd be useful to hear anything on that. Are there any other members that wish to say anything? If not, I'm going to move straight to the minister. Minister, over to you. Thank you, convener. Um, for these amendments, I'll start by saying, um, you know, I understand why members have proposed them. Um, I set out the response to committee's stage one report. We're committed to ensuring Thank you. We're uh, committed to ensuring uh, the use of uh, the new FPN powers, both effective and fair, and we want to make sure that householders are fully aware of the obligations and local authorities have appropriate and accessible uh, guidance about how they use this power. I agree in the importance of raising awareness of a householder's responsibility through education, engagement, communication and providing further uh, guidance. And I'm going to highlight two key points that are relevant. Firstly, householders are already required to comply with the householder duty of care. They can and should already check a waste carrier's registration details and confirm these details on the SEPA website to ensure that they're using a legitimate service. And Morris Golden made that point about awareness raising. I think in uh, week one of, of, of stage two, we talked about sometimes even looking at a website uh, could mean that it's buried under layers and layers and layers of clicks to get to the right information. So there's maybe a lot to be said for updating and, and having a, a, a review of how user-friendly some of these communication methods are as well. Um, secondly, ministers are already required under Section 34, subsection 7 of the Environmental Protection Act 1990 to prepare and issue a code of practice for the purpose of providing practical guidance on how to discharge the duty of care. The existing code of practice provides guidance to householders on how to meet their duty of care. And this will be amended to take into account the changes that were made by Section 10 of the Bill, namely that a breach of this duty will now be an offence, which may be addressed by way of a fixed penalty notice. Um, I th I Amendment 129 and 130, I, I thank Jackie Dunbar for raising the issues, and I can understand the, the, the reason that she has uh, put forward those amendments, ensuring that householders are aware 
of the responsibility to ask for confirmation of a waste carrier's authorisation or registration to carry waste can be addressed by way of communication and will be in included in the updated duty of care code of practice. But I think the points that have been made in this debate about displaying um, that on waste carriers the vehicles I think was a really really helpful one as well I mean again it comes down to the clarity of communication and the accessibility of, of that uh, information yes I thank the minister for taking the intervention it's in terms of because we when we had a visit when we were as a committee you know we did hear about unauthorized um, waste carriers do you have any more information about how big a problem that is within Scotland um, at present? Because, you know, if you go on, like, Facebook Marketplace, you know, you'll see lots of adverts saying, a man with a van will pick up all your rubbish for, for yeah. £20, £30 or whatever. And I, I don't think... I, I, until I was part of this committee, I had, n I had no idea that people had to have a, a waste yeah. uh, mm -hmm. certificate. And I'm probably that's the same for, for most people, I would yeah. imagine. So I'm just trying to understand how big a problem it actually is and do we have any data on it at all? Well, as for data, the issue with having data on unauthorised practices is really difficult to get because they're unauthorised. So, but we do know that it is a big problem in terms of actually specific data and how many people are actually carrying out unauthorised waste collection um, would be quite difficult because they're operating under the radar, so to speak. But I, I get Mr Lumsden's point, and I think that an assessment of how big a problem it is is, is, is important. But I think the, the wider point and the, probably the more, most important point is people understanding what power they have and what uh, responsibility they have as well to ask for the, the authorised carriers' identification and certificates associated with, with, with what they're doing. And I think that Mr Lumsden is right. Most people don't know that they have that power. Come back in, Minister, briefly. Yes. In terms of unauthorised, I guess the only, the only way we'd know... Yes, there'll be a lot that we don't know about, but I bet, guess be, there must be some that we do know about in terms of prosecu prosecutions by Police Scotland. Has there been, <clears throat> you, is that any data you've got at hand, or could that be delivered If, if there is, Mr Lumsden, I don't have it in front of me, but what is, uh, the fly tri tipping strategy, going back to fly tipping, um, we've funded SEPA to take forward work to analyse the issue there and to tackle illegal online trading. So that work's already been done. So we'll have a fuller picture as well. Um, right, let me just find out where I was. In respect of Amendment um, 130, an FPN for the breach of householder <coughs> duty of care may only be issued where there's a reason to believe that the householder has breached the duty by failing to take reasonable steps. Yes. I am, I'm listening really closely to, to what you're saying and the, for me to put forward those amendments, it was genuinely to tighten up procedures um, because, and it's to actually to go, kind of go back to the fly tipping situation earlier on. For me, if a householder ha can, can show that they've done due diligence that, like for myself personally, didn't know, like Mr Lumsden, uh, um, ab about the rules and regs before I came into this committee. And that was me being a local councillor for 15 years, and I still didn't realise realize them. Um, but it was to, 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 to help show that um, I've gone and done my best to ensure that I have asked an authorised person to pick up the... Uh, my bulky waste, because it was bulky waste I was, I was speaking about most. Um, so that if someone came to me and said, your stuff has been fly-tipped, then I could say, well, this is the certificate or licence number or whatever that I got from the person that said that they were, they were authorised to do so. Then that would help have a knock-on effect on, on maybe trying to catch the fly tippers as well. And that's where I was trying to, to, to come from as well. I realise by what you're saying that, um, that maybe there's a lot more work to be done. And if, if you, I'd be happy to work with you going forward on stage two if you think that it is feasible to do so. Stage three, I beg your pardon, if you think it's feasible to do so. Everything that you've said, uh, Mr Barr, is completely legitimate. And, I, and I, I totally understand why you've brought forward this amendment. I do want to work with you on something on, on this, to get this right, 
because I think that you are right in that it's almost like a it's almost like a deterrent to people that would actually put the, the you know go and uh, uh, take take waste purporting to be um, a, a waste uh, collector that's legitimate but isn't. It's about empowering the public to know that they can ask f for um, proof that they are. Um, let's work together on something ahead of stage three, which will have that effect that I can support. Um, I also understand the intention behind Amendment 36 from Morris Golden, um, but I do think it's unnecessary because existing mechanisms are already in place to ensure comprehensive information and practical guidance is available in relation to the duty of care obligations. But I come back to my point. Is it good enough? Is it clear enough? Is it accessible enough? Is it buried? <laughs> you know, and, um, and I think everyone gets my point. They've probably looked at this them, themselves and how accessible is that information. But I want to avoid placing unnecessary burdens, burdens on local authorities, because that's been a prominent concern of the committee when you do, took your stage one uh, uh, evidence. So I'd be keen not to Im impose additional unnecessary statutory responsibilities on them. But again, it's about sharing best practice and it's about local authorities and, uh, for example, reviewing how they are displaying this information and how they are communicating with, with the, uh, the people in their areas. So I urge the committee not to support Amendment 36, but I want to reassure the committee that we will continue to work with key partners to consider implementation plans, including communication and awareness raising activities, and ensuring that the Code of Practice is updated as required. Amendment 37 would amend this section so it would not apply to households using communal waste bins. Again, I don't believe this amendment is necessary. Uh, the obligations take reasonable steps such as confirming registration details only apply when a householder has organised an independent waste service to collect household waste. Um, but I think, again, we're working on things ahead of stage D, particularly with Ms Barr here, will we'll, we'll give a vehicle to improve the knowledge of householders in the rights that they have in this regard. Uh, there's no reason to exempt householders who use shared or communal bins. Um, I can't support that amendment. Um, on Amendment 38, um, I understand Mr Golden's intentions to ensure that provisions are fairly applied. It may be that in certain cases an enforcement officer would meet with a householder in order to, to de determine whether or not there's been a breach of duty of care without a reasonable excuse. However, this will not be practical, appropriate or necessary. In every case, there may be occasions where householders won't participate in a meeting with an enforcement officer and to compel them to do so in relation to a suspected criminal offence, I don't think that will be uh, appropriate. Um, I can't support this uh, and uh, would urge the committee not to. But again, I take the wider point uh, that's been made. Amendment 39 would allow local authorities to seek recompense from ministers for any unpaid fixed penalties uh, issued under section 10. I, I won't be supporting this. I, I, I don't support it. It fails to recognise that fixed penalty notices are not a mandatory payment, but rather provides a person with an opportunity to discharge any liability to criminal conviction by paying the penalty. I think everyone understands that. You pay the FPN, it doesn't go any further. It's a choice. The person is perfectly entitled to refuse the offer made by the FPN, with the result the enforcement officer may choose to report the offence to the procurator fiscal. An unpaid fixed penalty under this provision is not a civil debt that needs to be recovered in any way. It's just a way in which the person who is liable uh, can stop the action, pay the fine, move on. Um, finally, convener. Uh, understand the intentions behind Amendment 44, can't support it as drafted. I've indicated that Scottish Government's intention is to work with local authorities and other enfor enforcement bodies to develop guidance on the enforcement of householder duty and the use of FPN procedure in relation to the breaches of that duty. Although it's not essential, I agree that including a requirement to this effect within Section 10 could be useful. Um, the effect of subsection uh, 
three of this amendment would be to call into doubt whether the inserted new section 34ZC of the 1990 Act had actually come into force. And that would usually occur when section 10 of the bill is commenced using the power in section 19. Obviously, we're still to come to section 19, and I can, uh, I, I can give more information of that when we come to it. But I would urge the, the committee not to support amendment 44. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. I'm going to call on Jackie Dunbar to wind up and press a withdrawal amendment 129. Jackie. Uh, thank you, Convener. Again, I will be short and sweet and crisp and concise um, as this, this debate was. Um, I'm thankful to the Minister for taking on board um, what I was saying and um, the commitment that she's given me uh, to, to work uh, with me um, for going on to stage three. I hadn't taken into consideration um, the numbers on the side of vehicles, but I am more than happy to discuss that with the Minister. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to withdraw 129. Thank you very much. Uh, Jackie Dunbar wishes to withdraw Amendment 129. Does any member wish to object? No one wishes to object, therefore the uh, amendment is withdrawn. I call Amendment 36 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 129. Maurice Golden to move or not moved? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 36 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 129. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, the amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 38 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 129. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I call Amendment 130 in the name of Jackie Dunbar, already debated with Amendment 129. Uh, Jackie Dunbar to move or not moved? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I now call Amendment 106 in the name of Sue Webber, grouped with the amendments as shown in the groupings. Now, Sue Webber's not here, so Douglas Lumsden, I believe, is going to move Amendment 106 and speak to all the amendments within the group, which actually are all hers. So, uh, Mr yeah, Lumsden. And thank you, Convener, and I uh, can assure you that uh, Sue Webber's um, speaking notes were a lot shorter than uh, Murdo Fraser's ones earlier. Um, amendment 106, this amendment seeks to give local authorities more influence over the circular economy strategy where they are uh, affected. In particular, this amendment requires ministers to get approval from COSLA to change the level of fixed penalty notices regarding households' incorrect disposal of waste. If the government want to increase the maximum fine above £500, they, they, they must get approval from COSLA. The intention of this amendment, as with uh, every other amendment, is to ensure that ministers do not pass any regulation that affects local authorities without their explicit approval. Um, what, amendment 107 and um, 108, these amendments seek to give local authorities more influence over the circular economy strategy where they are affected. In particular, these amendments require ministers to get approval from COSLA before making any regulation regarding civil penalty charges. Um, amendments 109, 110, 111 um, are all serve the same purpose, which is to ensure when ministers are preparing a new code of practice of household waste strategy, uh, this code must get the explicit approval from COSLA. Um, amendments 112, 113 and 114 all ser serve to ensure ministers get approval from COSLA when setting targets for local authorities' household waste recycling targets. Uh, the wording in the bill, as currently drafted on, requires them to be consulted, whereas this amendment would require that COSLA must approve the targets. Amendment 115, um, ministers must seek approval from COSLA on any regulation relating to the penalty notices served to individuals littering from a vehicle. Um, amendments 116 and 117, once again, ministers must seek and get approval from COSLA on regulation relating to powers to search and seize vehicles, specifically relating to the handling of seized properties and the ability to apply enforcement. I guess the the, the, the thrust of all these um, amendments is, you know, we have a Verity House agreement where local government and Scottish government should be working closely together. Um, and these amendments are really just to make sure that they are more than consulted, but they are actually part of the decision making. Of course. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Um, I'm just wondering, was there approval from COSLA to move these amendments which require various approvals from COSLA? Uh, I am not aware of any um, um, agreement with, with COSLA, but I'm sure that they would be open to actually um, being part of that, that process as opposed to just being consulted. Uh, is that you finished, Mr. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking around to see if any other members want to contribute. Uh, they don't appear to, therefore I'm going to move to the Minister. Minister. Thank you, Convener. Um, I understand Ms Webber's intention, but I can't support the, the amendments in this group, and I'll out outline why. Amendments would require the Scottish Government not only to consult with COSLA, which we do regularly, but to seek its approval for any draft regulations under these powers. And I, I want to be clear, the approval of these regulations lies with Parliament. Um, the Verity House Agreement already underpins the approach to engagement between the Scottish Government and COSLA. The Scottish Government remains committed to this agreement. I don't see these provisions as necessary uh, for their continued joint working, uh, which COSLA have described. I, it's not my understanding that my predecessor, and certainly I have not had COSLA been asking for this. Um, in fact, they've said the collaboration in this bill uh, is an excellent, and this is a quote, excellent and leading example of working in the spirit of and implementing the Verity House uh, Agreement, and full kudos to that goes to my uh, predecessor for her engagement with the uh, COSLA leaders. We will continue that approach into the co-production development of the regulations to support the Bill. In many cases, there is already a requirement to consult local government on the face of the Bill. For example, Section 12 regarding the Code of Practice and Section 13 regarding targets already set out that Scottish Ministers consult publicly and seek the views of local authorities. Amendment uh, 160, in the name of Jack and Dunbar, brings forward a requirement to consult local government on the development of guidance relating to Section 11 and new enforcement powers for waste contamination. We'll be supporting that amendment. More generally, our approach would be to consult local government on any regulations. We uh, expect that this would involve COSLA. Uh, however, for all of these amendments, there's a technical concern with naming COSLA on the face of the bill. It is not common practice. Typically, when outlining consultation duties in legislation, local authorities, the phrase local authorities, are named. Uh, whilst in practice this often leads to COSLA being consulted, it allows for consultation with individual local authorities as well, or with any other organisation representative of local authority uh, interests. And of course, we have seen in the past that COSLA has not been the only body that has been representative of local authorities. So it would not be correct to name them, yes. Yeah, you're right. There was a, a breakaway group from COSLA, but I think it was my understanding that the Scottish Government only really consulted with COSLA and didn't really consult with the other local authorities that weren't part of COSLA. The, uh, the reason is that it's actually about what's actually the wording in the bill. If you put in local authorities, then obviously that includes any local authority that is represented by any organisation. So I think that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from there. In addition, while the intention behind these amendments may not be to explicitly obtain approval from COSLA, there could be unintended negative consequences if such language is used, as, as I've said. For these reasons, I can't support uh, those amendments. Thank you, Convener. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I call on uh, Douglas Lumsden to wind up and press or, um, or withdraw Amendment 106. Douglas. Yeah, I'll just uh, sum up briefly. You know, I feel that um, you know, all through this bill, it's um, local authorities that are going to be really impacted by everything that's um, um, in, the, in this bill. And I think it's only right that they have a, a proper um, seat at that table. And I, I feel that they must be uh, consulted. I don't think the, um, the wording is strong enough. And um, you know, I, I would imagine that if I changed the word COSLA to local authorities, um, that would have been knocked back by the, uh, the minister as well. So I'm happy to press uh, Amendment 106. Thank you very much. So the question is that Amendment 106 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 129, Maurice Golden to move or not move. The amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 
40 in the name of Graham Simpson already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that if Amendments 40 and 41 are direct alternatives, Morris Simpson, uh, sorry, Morris Simpson, that's a complete mix up. I'm not sure it's a good one. Graham Simpson to move or not move. <laughs> Uh, not moved. Uh, uh, the amendment is not moved. Therefore, I call Amendment 41 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5, Graham Simpson, to move or not move. Moved. Uh, the question that is that Amendment 41 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 42 in the name of Graham Simpson already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendment 42 and 43 are direct alternatives. Uh, Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. The question... The call Amendment 43 in the name of Graham Simpson already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is, that Member 43 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. That is two votes for, five votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 129. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 45 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Uh, the question is that Section 10 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Good, thank you. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Maurice Golden, coupled with Amendments 105, 57, 118 and 65. Maurice Golden to move Amendment 46 and speak to all the amendments in their group. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, happy to move Amendment 46, which I think the substantive argument behind we've already covered. In terms of Amendment 65, uh, I think this is a, an additional um, ask, which is really for Scottish ministers to provide the funding to local authorities for um, auditing receptacles of household waste under 46. I think it's very important that the inspection scheme for proper disposal um, is, it, it is funded and is appropriate. Um, Amendment 57 in this group is, is really a reflection on, I think we're again going back 20 years, so we know if we went back 20 years, it's actually really simple to get a recycling rate now of 60 or 70 per cent without, without breaking sweat. Um, all you need to do is, is roll out consistent collections, same coloured bins um, uh, across the vast majority of Scotland um, and, uh, and ultimately you get more bang for your buck in terms of communications because it's all very similar. But I'm keen to understand, unfortunately, we're not sitting here 20 years ago. We've had um, a, a real lack of motivation from the Scottish Government uh, in terms of um, applying the waste hierarchy, recycling, um, particularly over the last decade. Um, it started out so well, I, I should add. Uh, and I'm really keen to, give, given that we know how well things and what should have happened, from the starting point now, how do we get to that point? What is the other solutions being uh, put in place? Because it's easy for me to say sitting here, yes, we want the same colour bins, this is the right way. But given that there's been deviations across local authorities, what are the costs around that? The Scottish Government will have them to hand. You know, they, unlike me, can, can work out the costs of, of all of that. And therefore, what is the reasonable ask in this space? What is the evidence-based approach around achieving, I mean, achieving the, the targets that the Scottish Government have set previously? So not my targets, their own targets. Um, I, I recognise it's very easy to do the 2013 target, but as you get higher and higher, issues like this amendment 
become far more prevalent. And the Scottish Government will have all the evidence they can release that and say, well, actually, we can't go to these colours because it will cost certain local authority X, Y and Z. Happy, Monica. Yeah. To, to Morris, um, I just try to understand, because I understand the aim and the issues around lack of consistency um, and I think the desire there is to simplify, but would this only apply to new bins? What happens to existing bins and the different colours that we already have? I wouldn't narrate the colours of my recycling no. bins, but they're probably different from your recycling bins. So what happens with the existing bins of which we have many across Scotland right now? Well, that's the, that's the exact point. That's the Scottish Government will have an exact cost for that. There might be changes, there might be... It might be impossible to have standardisation of colours. It might be that that doesn't work, but the whole purpose of this amendment is for the Scottish Government to say, look, this is where we're at, we can't turn back time, and therefore this is, our, this is how we're going to meet our own targets. And that's all I'm, I'm just trying to help the Scottish Government meet their own targets more than a decade late. Um, there's, there's, there's lots, you know, I can get to 50% on my own, so I'm sure the Sc Scottish Government can. But beyond that, things get more challenging, and that's where we need the information which the Scottish Government will have access to to, to answer your question. Because I don't know how much it will cost. I know it can be done, but how much would that cost individual local authorities? Yeah, happy to. Um, thanks for taking the intervention. Um, I just wonder whether Mor Maurice Golden would agree, agree with me. It's not so much the colour of your bins, it is what is recycled uh, and how much uh, your local council, whoever it is, uh, is actually recycling. Um, so would you, would you agree that, you know, actually the colour of somebody's bins is, is neither here nor there. It is a question of, you know, how much can you put in the bins to recycle? I think it, that's important. I think it does make it easier if you've got the same colours. I think there was... Um, Glasgow did a, a TV ad which uh, bled into East Renfrewshire and Renfrewshire around put X in your blue bin, for example, and then East Renfrewshire uh, residents were very confused because that wasn't what they needed to, to put in. But this is the importance of this. It's about the Scottish Government saying... This is our vision. This is how we're going to achieve very basic targets. Because to just, just put this all in play, in terms of tackling net zero, if we can't get curbside recycling right, forget forget net zero. May as well all go home. There's no point. This is a really basic thing to do, uh, and you can literally lift and lay ways to do it from other. Um, uh, regions and other uh, countries, uh, even in the UK. And therefore, um, I think it's important to, to bring some of these aspects out because I'm increasingly seeing, for example, Angus Council are taking glass out of their um, DMR bin and asking people to bring it to bring sites. So, you know, there's, there's pros and cons with all these things, but what's clear is that guidance to local authorities around achieving targets is going to be really important. Yeah. As you mentioned other regions and maybe other countries that we could learn from, are you aware of countries that have maybe shifted towards a more uniform approach in terms of whether it's colour, or information that goes alongside the bin, whether it's a sticker or something, to say this can go in here, this can't. Are, are you aware of examples that we maybe could look at? Well, we don't need to go far. So you look at uh, examples of Scotland versus England. England broadly didn't have the same positive narrative around recycling, the same ambitious targets. Broadly is exactly the same, or a very similar recycling rate. OK. Um, Wales did uh, a very different approach. They had, if you like, the Scottish version of positivity and words, and they linked that to action. And that's why the recycling rates are so high. Now, that's not the only way to do it. This is the central point around this. The easiest thing to do would have been... <clears throat> 
Apologies. The easiest thing to do would have been to start the Welsh example 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and, and roll it out in that manner. What do we do now? Can we lift and lay that exact approach? It's a, it's a, more, it's a patchwork quilt now, and it's going to be more challenging. Yes, happy to. So I, I presume this, all these amendments are really about standardisation, so you can have a, a national campaign, for example, better education, and then that would drive up recycling rates. Uh, it would, but I want to know from the Scottish Government if that's possible. Because that's, we've got, as, as, in response to Monica Lennon's uh, question, we know that the Welsh model works. Can that be important? I can't answer that, informa uh, answer that question without the information that the Scottish Government and local authorities have. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Skelton. Uh, I think the next amendments are Sarah Boyett's Amendment 105, um, and I think, Monica, you're going to move those on her, that amendment on her behalf. Yeah, I'm afraid it's, it's back to me. Um, so, Sarah Boyack apologises. She's um, away on parliamentary business um, today. So, 105, um, the intention is to exempt residents living in a tenement or flat, um, as defined under the 2004 Act, uh, defining what those properties are. Um, it's to exempt those residents from the, the penalties. And as we've heard before, and usually from the Deputy Convener, who I hope will speak maybe to this item, because he knows about it much more than me, um, there were concerns, and we put this into our Stage 1 report, um, concerns had been highlighted that the penalties in Section 11 um, would be applied to those in communal um, properties and the committee, we were keen to get more, more clarity um, on that. Now, Sarah Boyack is a, a member for the Lothians and is keen to highlight that in Edinburgh, for example, there's a, a number of tenements and flats where waste and recycling bins are shared um, among a number of properties and that's the same for other MSPs with an interest in tenements and flats in their areas. We know that where there is a factor, it's often the case that factors will arrange um, for disposal of waste that's been left next to bins or where the wrong recyclers have been put in the wrong bin and the cost is then divided among the properties. Um, Sarah Boyack has brought this forward because there's a concern that residents could be hit twice in the pocket and the aim of Amendment 170 is to ensure that there is protection for residents of flats and tenements. Thank you very much uh, and I'm going to call myself to speak to Amendment 118 and any other amendments in the group. Amendment 118 is very similar to the amendment that M Maurice Golden was suggesting and this came about because we heard uh, during stage one evidence the importance of separating waste and what happens if you don't separate waste and I think we were at bin group and we saw a big pile of waste which is impossible to sort through because it hadn't been sorted out properly and what they said clearly to us and other recyclers are that if we separate out uh, waste properly it can be used better and, and actually the recycling of it can generate income to cover the costs of it, which was the aim of my amendment uh, to try and form a standardised waste across Scotland. Now, I was aware when I did it that that wouldn't obviously work on the islands because a lot of the waste on the islands is incinerated and they have a procedure for that. But I felt to myself that uh, the evidence suggested that, that we should have a standard uh, procedure across the 32 authorities in Scotland, which clearly we don't. Uh, I think there are probably, probably in excess of 20 variations to the scheme, so you can have different colour bins uh, and different recycling taking place. Now, we've all seen great examples. Uh, Murray Busters, for example, Waste Busters, uh, collect stuff and, and resell it at recycling centres. But that doesn't happen everywhere. So we've got to recycle on uh, our, our doorsteps if we've got recycling bins, which I would say that I haven't uh, yet because the lorry can't get up the narrow road to where the bins are. So I have to recycle myself. And I'm happy to do that. And people are happy to do it. And they do it with a clarity when they know what bin it's to go into. 
and there is some confusion. Now, I did take the opportunity uh, to speak to the Minister prior to this debate. Uh, I think it was uh, I stopped her on the way to lunch and she said, no, this is a bad idea. I'm not going to support the amendment because of the cost involved. But the principle, I think she was happy with. I think it was the cost that she was involved with. But maybe she'll come back. But my suggestion is it doesn't have to be just about bin colours. You could change simply the lids on the bin so that everyone knows uh, the way of doing it. And if my amendment fails to get through, then that's something I will push. Uh, as far as... Sorry, yes, of course. Question on that, because, you know, I think this point's been made, you know, through this committee evidence uh, on cyclical economy, but elsewhere I remember having a discussion ahead of COP26 with uh, an organisation supporting people with learning disabilities to you know, be in, engaged in, in COP26 and this point came up about bins actually, about why do we have all these different colours of bins and if you're maybe working in one area learning in another, visiting family, so people were saying they, they got confused, particularly people who do have additional um, support needs. There would be a cost and there'd be a lot of um, faff, not a technical word, but there'd be a lot of work involved in even changing the lids. I don't know who would, who would do that, but could a, a remedy not be a, a sticker perhaps that could be placed on bins? Could that work? It, it, it could be anything, but I think the point, and, and I think Ms Lennon's right, the point is, is, and the evidence that we heard, is the more standardisation we have, the more likelihood people are to ensure that they put the right things in the bin. Uh, it wasn't until I went to uh, some of the people that we visited, including Change Waste, that, that I realised that plastic bottles meant just plastic bottles. It doesn't necessarily mean other plastic containers. And the fact that we have separation in this parliament uh, for, for the waste is extremely helpful. It's interesting that the rest of the government buildings in Edinburgh don't use the same system. But I'm all for recycling where we can <laughs> and to educate people. And the easiest way to do that is to hand, have a standard scheme, which we see in countries, I believe, such as Norway and Sweden, uh, where it is more diverse. I have some sympathies with Sarah Boyett's Amendment 105 towards uh, tenements and, and, and the, the bills. My problem is, I would say it goes further than that. If you drive around the countryside, you see the bins at every single road end, all lined up neatly there, because no longer do waste authorities, collectors of waste, travel down to the properties. They want them stacked at the roadside. If you stack them at the roadside, then you get what most of us get is all sorts of waste put in it. Um, and, you know, poo bags from dogs appear in every single recycling bin, and I'm not sure that any of it's recyclable. Um, but there's that. And then uh, I would just say that I think Maurice Golden ha ha has made the point the same point that I wish to make. And if I've misquoted the Minister, no doubt she will correct me. She will be very strong on that, no doubt, to support my amendment. And I then conclude at that stage, and, and I'll move to the Deputy Convener, who's indicated he wished to speak on the, these amendments. Thank you, Convener. And this section of the Bill, Section 10, is... Uh, sorry, Section 11, rather, is... Uh, of, of course intended, as we heard through our Stage 1 evidence, to improve household uh, recycling and household waste management and through that improve the recycling quality of what is uh, administered by our local authorities. A very challenging exercise and we all know that uh, contamination of recycling is uh, not only frustrating for other citizens who are taking the time to sort their recycling, uh, but also means that local authorities then do not uh, get the reward of high quality recycling and it makes it difficult for those processing that recycling to, to do so uh, effectively. So I, I commend the government for trying to improve the quality of recycling in Scotland and therefore the delivery of more recycling. Uh, but I do think we need to be careful in uh, using uh, punitive measures on households and individuals. And I think that uh, the amendments in this group are helpful probing amendments. First of all, 105 by uh, Sarah Boyack. As a representative of a constituency that has a, a very large amount of tenement housing, 
you could walk past the communal bins that serve the tenements in my constituency and if you lift the lid as I do from time to time you will see a high degree of contamination much of which will have been uh, perpetrated by passers-by not by the households for which those communal bins serve not by those tenement residents so I, I think uh, I'd be looking for reassurance from the government that consideration around communal uh, bins and uh, making sure that those who live in tenements are not unfairly, unfairly penalised uh, by uh, passers-by contaminating the recyclet, then uh, I would be looking for, for that. Uh, and I think this probing amendment from Sarah Boyack is helpful in that regard. And in terms of uh, the convener's amendment uh, 118 in the name of Edward Mountain, this reflects again the evidence we took at stage one around creating a consistency of how recycling is done in the majority of Scotland. Uh, the, perhaps there's, there's uh, improvement to the drafting that can, can be done ahead of stage three, uh, but the principle of having a, a consistent position across Scotland I think will be helpful in uh, encouraging uh, better recycling and less contamination. And through that, importantly, attracting more investment. There is a huge amount of uh, commercial incentive to invest in recycling uh, across the UK and beyond. Uh, we want to attract that to Scotland. Uh, and in order to do that, we need to uh, reduce contamination and improve the recyclet. And I think consistency in terms of people knowing uh, which bin to put what in will be helpful in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, looking round to see if there's any other members. Uh, Graham Simpson, I think you want to come in. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, convener. I'd, I just wanted to uh, comment on Sarah Boyack's Amendment 105, um, which, which I hope is not a probing amendment. It's a very sensible amendment, uh, and it's, it's the, the you know it's the issue of um, rubbish in tenement buildings and. Ben McPherson has you know, outlined the issues there very well. Um, and as someone who's lived in a, a, a couple of flats in, in Edinburgh, you know, I've seen just the, just the uh, situation that Ben McPherson out, outlines is that in both those cases, uh, recycling bins were often chock-a-block um, and usually had uh, contempt contaminated waste in them um, so I think yeah, yeah I think it'd be really unfair to have a provision in a bill which could penalize a, a resident um, of a tenement where the, where their bins are contaminated because I don't know who you who on earth you would find um, Ben McPherson's absolutely right if the if the bins are on the street sometimes if they're not on the street they could be in a bin store even if it's not locked, then people can access it. Um, but you, you, can, you can get people just wandering along and putting their rubbish uh, into a bin. So I, I, yes, yes, of course. I, I actually totally understand that. And, and, and it's a point that the deputy convener brought up during stage one uh, debates the whole time. Do, does the member also concede that, that in rural areas where bins are at road ends, the contamination is just as likely to occur as it could in tenement buildings? Yes, um, and I bow to your expertise on that one. I don't live in a rural area, but um, I can see that actually the same problem. You know, if you leave a bin somewhere, it's not right next to your house, then people, do, people can just come along and put their rubbish in it. Um, so I think, in fact, even in um, a town where I live, perfectly possible for that to happen. If you put your bins out to be collected, then anyone could come along. You know, usually they're put out overnight, but somebody could come along and put the wrong things in, in, in my bin or Monica Lennon's bin or you know, and, and anyone else, or Mr. Ruskell even. I don't know where he lives, but, but that, there is that issue. Yes. Well, in, 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 indeed, I do live in a rural area, but isn't, isn't that the difficulty, though, of trying to um, sort of carve out a particular type of property 
um, from this provision. I mean, there needs to, it needs to be applied proportionately. It needs to be pro pro applied in a way which, you know, recognises that communities are, are different and that waste collection is different. Um, and I think what we heard throughout stage one evidence is that where those local authorities are really doing that educational piece and are looking at um, how they support householders, um, you know, that, that is very important work and that, you know, applying a sanction is an absolute last resort. I mean, I, I appreciate there are, there are complexities there with tenements, but there are those complexities and others risks of um, contamination with, with, any, with any form of, um, you know, bin collection at a road end or bin collection with shared use or whatever. So it is, it is you know, beholden on good practice to kind of work these things through. And I think, you know, local authorities are at the moment generally good at this. Um, and therefore it would be <coughs> difficult to try and carve out a particular, uh, a particular type of uh, exemption. I think, I think to answer Mr. Ruskell's point that you know, I think, I think there are issues full stop with penalising people um, for putting the wrong stuff in their bins. You can only really do it if you catch them at it, in terms of evidence. But, yes. No, I mean, I think it's an interesting conversation. I mean, 105 and Sarah Boyack's name, and I know others have an interest in that. I think it's in recognition of the particular challenges that face those in tenement housing, uh, not on a rare occasion, but on a fairly typical occasion. I mentioned factoring, so we know that um, residents of, of tenement housing already are familiar with having to you know, chip in and, and, and cover the cost that the, the factor will, will send the bill. So, you know, if that alone was a, you know, a, a sort of disincentive. We know that it's, it, the problem's not really coming from the residents because they're, they're already finding out that they're getting charged. So it's, sometimes it's the incidental stuff that happens because people are passing by and, and using those bins. So, you know, does Graham Simpson agree that Sarah Boyack's amendment is right to focus on tenement housing because there are particular challenges for those who live in, in those homes? Well, it, it is right. I was going on to say that. It's absolutely right because we can identify a particular type of property where there is an issue. But, you know, as the convener and Mr. Ruskell have pointed out, there can, there can be other properties that can also be affected. But I think Sarah Boyack is absolutely right to put this am amendment forward. Sometimes, let's be frank, it is the residents that are doing the wrong thing, um, but, but sometimes it's not. So I think, I think uh, yeah, I mean, I hope Monica Lennon uh, press, presses this, but I'd be, I'd be really interested if the minister's not in agreement that she really needs to explain why not, because, you know, it's a serious issue. Thank you very much. Uh, minister, uh, your chance to correct me as Medal has responded well, to the debate. I very much enjoy our private conversations, convener in the lunch queue, and it would be a shame it would be a shame if we couldn't have those conversations without me being misrepresented. Now, actually, I, 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 say, I, say, I say that gently um, because the convener, is, as a gentleman, has allowed me the, the chance to come back uh, on that point, and I will address it. Um, I, I think I said something quite slightly different, but if uh, we, we can discuss that when I come to it. Um, these amendments, a lot in these amendments... Um, it relates to two, two themes it had been a specific focus for the committee. Uh, the importance of ensuring the new regime for enforcement of household waste requirements is fairly applied, and secondly, the potential to standardise the colour of receptacles used to collect household waste and recycling. And I'll address these in turn. Um, Amendment 46 and 105 from Morris Golden and Sarah Boyack would introduce exemptions from civil penalty regime. Now, um, I am going to explain why I'm not going to accept those amendments. Um, I agree that in guidance, we need to consider carefully the intended, re uh, the intended enforcement approach for communal bins, as clearly there are going to be specific factors need to be taken into account, and members have expressed them today, Mr McPherson expressed the, you know, the, the contamination of waste by passers-by in urban areas, uh, you know, you see that. You've also got, of course, a, a situation in the... Uh, 
in, in places like, like Edinburgh that have a lot of tourists where they might not be familiar with, with the regimes, particularly if the instructions have worn off. The bends has happened in, in, in my area of Edinburgh that I, I live in when I'm down at Parliament and uh, me and some neighbours got in touch with the local council to say, you know, could we have better signage on them? Because I was beginning to even get confused as to where I should put uh, my, my waste. So, I, again, I, I completely take that on board. I can't support amendments to simply exempt a type of householder. Um, our amendment 105 is that the issue is uh, if it, if this, on amendment 105, if it creates a blanket exemption for everyone who lives in tenement housing, this will go against the purpose of uh, trying to increase recycling rates. It would be really quite a, a loophole. Um, the provision in relation to civil penalties outlined a clear process and requirement. First of all, let's go through it. A written warning is issued. And, and also, I would say that it, this is about tackling persistent, gross, deliberate contamination. If I could just continue with my point, uh, Mr Lumsden, a written warning would be issued. Then only if the failure to comply continues or there is a new similar failure to comply, a notice of intent to require payment of a civil penalty is issued with a period of time for representations to be made as to why the civil penalty charge should not be required. Then after consideration of any representations, a final notice to pay a civil penalty uh, may be served. So again, it's to tackle this persistent and deliberate contamination of waste. So I don't well, you'll at least join the queue, Mr Simpson. I'll take Douglas Slumson first. But would not, that would not apply to a situation where, you know, somebody has put something in the wrong bin by mistake. It's where there's been, you know, uh, evidenced, uh, evidenced, deliberate contamination. Mr Lumsden. Yeah, I, th I thank the Minister. I'm just trying to work out how that would actually work in practice, because a, ri a written warning, would that be to everyone in the, the tenement building? And then the final notice, would that be to everyone in the tenement building? And the civil penalty, would that just be divvied out between people in the tenement building? I would actually work in practice. And I think that's why the reason for excluding that is it would be is, you know, part of that amendment. So in any situation where a penalty is, is, is put on somebody, there has to be evidence behind that. Um, there would be the result of an individual responsible being identified as deliberately contaminating or failure to comply with this. And that could be evidenced. I would think that we're moving into a situation uh, that Mr Lumsden describes where there's a big blanket penalty in the whole block. It wouldn't be a, a thing that could be, it could be evidenced at all. Um, so, after consideration of any... Can I just continue with the point and I'll come to Mr Simpson. Local authorities, Mr Lumsden, would only use these new powers as a last resort after other options to engage with and support householders been attempted and should the written warning be heeded, there will be no penalty to pay. Mr Simpson. So, uh, it's a very similar to p point to the one made by Douglas Lumsden. And that is, if you've got people living in flats, how on earth are you going to identify a, a persistent culprit? Is that what the minister is saying? That if there is a persistent culprit, which there might be, how are you going to identify those individuals? And if that is the minister's stance, that she is not after everyone who lives in a block, shouldn't she spell that out in the legislation? That approach to enforcement, including the approach to communal bins, uh, is going to be created in consultation with local authorities. Now, some local authorities are probably doing very well in terms of contaminated waste and the levels of contaminated waste. And that sharing of good practice and how they manage that is important. That's the right way to go about this. Not a top-down approach from, from me. It's about enabling that co-production in the, spirity, the spirit of the Verity House Agreement. As to, no, I won't, Mr Simpson, because I think the convener would like me to move on. This...
convener, are you open to me taking more interventions? I, 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 the, the, the stage two debate is meant to be entirely a debate, so if you're happy to continue yeah. it, I, 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 I have no time constraints. It, it is becoming a little back and forth between Mr. Me and Mr. Simpson. I will take um, Ben well, McPherson, I'm, because I think that, you know, I want to get to the end of my points, but I want to take maybe a new point that's going to be made by Ben McPherson that might in, uh, advance the debate. I, can I just say that I, I'm not going to get involved in any debate on which intervention you're going to take, but... I, I, I would like to see debate happen at, at this stage, so it's up to you, but I, I acknowledge you're going to Ben first and start with. Uh, th thank you, Convener, and thank you, Minister, for taking my intervention. It's appreciated, and I, I think it's been very helpful to hear uh, your uh, feedback on these matters, because the, the nature of tenement properties and communal bins, often the communal bin will actually serve more than one tenement block on a street. And the fact that you've, uh, one, been able to outline that the, the guidance will take in feedback from specific local authorities for their area, but also that there will be a process of uh, investigation before any warning, let alone civil penalty, is served, um, gives me the reassurance that this power would uh, from what you've you've said and from what the guidance will entail only be utilized where potentially a household or a, a number of households within a wider tenemental area have been identified as contaminating those communal bins and i actually think given the feedback from my constituents over the years that if people are identified who are contaminating shared waste facilities on their street, there would be support amongst uh, the other uh, residents of the tenemental properties who, who want to see those bins used in the appropriate way. Uh, so they would support action being taken against individuals who are contaminating the waste uh, for the yeah. Uh, I agree with Mr McPherson on that, but I also agree that local authorities know best how to work together to talk about how they enforce this as well. But I'll come back to Mr McPherson's earlier point. All those householders are doing their best to wash the, the recycled items to make sure they're not contaminated, to put them in the right bins. There will be considerable um, anger when there is individuals that are contaminating that waste as well. So, but it's right that it's evidenced. Um, I want to just talk about householders are not going to be fined for simple mistakes or if someone else puts the wrong item in a bin. That's completely disproportionate. A civil penalty issued by the result of responsible individual being identified is failing to require the requirement, given a written warning. And the, the, I, again, come back to that sort of like deliberate, gross, uh, you know, contamination, deliberate, willful contamination of that. Uh, these powers would not allow for an enforcement offer to simply issue warning notices or penalty notices for everyone who uses a particular communal bin. This is again about persistent, gross, deliberate contamination and evidenced. Um, I want to move on, if I, if I could, uh, to again to, to talking about the issue of the colours of, of bins and consistency throughout Scotland. So, convener, if I could just clarify the arguments that I gave you privately uh, initially when you talked about this. Um, I said I was concerned about a couple of things here. I, first of all, think that a sort of mainland Scotland approach, where no matter which local authority area you're in, that everyone's knows knows the score with regard to which bin to put things in is, is laudable and it's a uh, it's something that the co-design process may arrive at and i would congratulate them for arriving at that but it would be for them to decide if that's the approach they want to that, that's my point i think i said to mr mountain i would initially be concerned if it was compelled about the plastic waste associated miss lennon made that point in this debate as well. The plastic waste of councils were compelled to change their bin colours by a, a certain point. Now, this co-design process may come to a point where there's an agreement between all local authorities that they want to standardise the colour, but they maybe take into account when this is done. 
So, for example, Aberdeenshire Council have recently introduced a separate colour of bin, uh, an orange bin. Um, it's, it's newly rolled out. We're all getting used to it. So we've got three recycling bins. Those are new bins. We've got three recycling bins, um, four actually, including food waste. If they've made that procurement choice for all those bins and they've decided on that colour, and I say now we're going to standardise everything, that everything's going to have to be the same colour as another local authority, the same amount of bins and that, they would justifiably turn around and say, well, that's our decision to make. Why are you taking away that power from us? But also, how much plastic waste is going to be you know, is going, is going to be um, made as a, as a result, if I could just keep, keep uh, making my point. So I think that was the initial thing. However, I think the idea of having a, a standardised approach across Scotland might be something that's arrived at by this co-design process. And I would be, I, I would think that that would be a great thing, but it could be a case of like, at the point at which they're making a procurement decision, then it kicks in that we are going to standardise with the other local authorities. Would the Minister there's take also the intervention? A, I was going to say, there was also what the cost of it was mentioned as well. If that's something in the co-design process that is discussed and debated amongst those involved in that co-design process, then they can they can make that um, they can they can make that sort of like cost evaluation associated with that. Morris Golden. Uh, Thank you. Um, just uh, two questions. Firstly, I appreciate your comment around the colours of bins, given investment local authorities have made. Would the Scottish Government give any consideration around coloured stickers linked to numbers or letters for want as a part of a kind of standardisation process? And secondly, the co-design process, which has been articulated is essentially the same process, as far as I can tell, that's been going on for a decade or more and has resulted in a flat lining of recycling rates. So I'm just wondering how doing the same thing again will drastically change the outcome. Well, I think my issue is that I mean, and I, and I absolutely get the frustration that Morris Golden has articulated here. I get that. Um, you know, if we, if we leave it all up to local authorities to decide what they do in this area and they keep on making the same decisions that do not improve on recycling rates, then we, we've got a problem. But I think that this bill is articulating what we expect to happen. We want the uh, recycling rate rates to improve. We want local councils to work together to decide on how they can best do that working. And it's about that knowledge sharing. Could Going back to Miss Lennon's point, I don't want to open the, the nappies debate, but it's about sharing of best practice. I don't want to prejudge the outcome of that co-design process, but I imagine that those who are going to be involved in that co-design process are listening very carefully to Mr Mountain's point, Mr Golden's point, my point even, is standardisation the way to go? But I'm no. not going to say that top down. I want that to be part of the... Uh, would the Minister give way just yeah. briefly? Sorry, I, I very much take the point that, that, she's, that she's making. But um, as I understand it, you know, if we don't do something now, the process will keep evolving without control. So you've suggested that Aberdeen, oh, and I, I'm not sure if it's Aberdeen or Aberdeenshire, Shire, so I apologise to Aberdeen. Aberdeen Shire produced an orange bin, which would suggest that there'd be, if that happened in Murray, there'd be five bins. And I'd be totally confused because green, blue, pink, uh, brown, orange, we'll run out of colours before we'll get to a standardised process. So would the Minister not believe that, having heard that, I think from the Deputy Convener, that if you standardise the, the waste, there is, it's going to get people to invest in that waste uh, and recycling it. It would be better to have a plan of action in the bill now rather than just to let this evolve through evolution because we've heard evolution doesn't work. It's, it's too diverse. So first of all, code of practice at the moment is voluntary. This bill is going to make it mandatory. So if whatever is decided, I also have faith that those in local authorities who will be uh, have statutory the targets the incentives of statutory targets and a code of practice 
that is mandatory, not voluntary, will react to that. And they will decide together how best to achieve those targets. I think we need to give them that, that, that chance to do that. I think all too often in this place, Scottish Government gets criticised for the top-down approach on things. This is not in the spirit of Verity House. This is not in the spirit of working with our local authority par partners. And it's not in the spirit of the empowerment of local authorities to do that. But I think the arguments that everyone has made today about standardisation are made very well. And those involved in the co-design will probably be listening to that. I would be very surprised if standardisation isn't a main focus of the co-design process. Um, can, yes. Yeah, thanks for, for giving away. I mean, I, I do accept a lot of the arguments that have been brought forward by members around standardisation, but is there also, uh, you know, an element of responding to innovation as well? Because, yeah. you know, we are going to see presumably recycling uh, technology improve over yeah. time. There may well be an economic argument to bring in curbside collection of certain materials in, in the future. Uh, that doesn't exist now, there might be a need to segregate materials in the future. I'm not sure what that looks like, but kind of baking into law standardisation feels, feels a little bit excessive and that the, perhaps a code of conduct, uh, sorry, a code of practice that, 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 could, that could be developed further with local authorities might be the most appropriate way yeah. to I'm actually most... drive things forward. But yeah. I'm kind of a little bit nervous about saying, well, you know, it has to be it has to be this colour and this size of bin. I mean, we have seen over time, uh, certainly in my local authority, um, collection systems change over time due to the price of recycler, not, not actually to do with any willingness or lack of willingness to bring standardisation. Mm -hmm. And, and perhaps, perhaps it's hostage to fortune to kind of just sort of fake in a fixed model because that's what we think will, will drive things forward. It's an argument <clears throat> that you have articulated very well, Mr Ruskell, is that you don't want to do anything in, in primary legislation that is inflexible and doesn't take into account innovation and would actually cause a, a, a problem if, if there were certain trends change in the types of recycling uh, um, that's required. So I absolutely take on that point and I think you've, you've just made my argument even stronger so um, on this. I think we all agree that local authorities and those involved in the co-design process need that flexibility, but they also need to bring their experience to, to bear in that co-design process. I'm going to move just, um, uh, convener, I'll, I'll, I'll finish off just by saying that um, Amendment 65 from Morris Golden proposes that the Scottish Government phrase resources for an audit of household waste rece uh, receptacles I'm not quite sure what, what benefits would be uh, derived from such an endeavour, or indeed the cost of the public purse. Um, and as part of the co-design process with COSLA and local authorities, research requirements and any gaps in our knowledge will be identified. This could include an audit of the number and types of waste receptacles, but I am going to leave that to them uh, to, to identify those gaps. Legislating for such a project before the design process has even begun, I think, is counterproductive and potentially a waste of resources. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Maurice Golden, can I ask you to wind up, please, and press or withdraw Amendment 46? Maurice. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think the bin fines is, is unfortunately a rabbit hole. I think it might be worthy of consideration, but as we've heard from the Minister, it will only be used in the most... Um, unusual cases, shall we say, based on the evidence that is likely to be presented and therefore um, I would respectfully suggest any length of time spent on it by the team is a distraction from transformational changes which could be worked on. But nonetheless, that is what the Scottish Government want to make as, as, as part of their uh, agenda for a circular economy. Um, uh, I fail to, to see that argument. Um, nonetheless, I think that the, uh, in terms of the standardisation of, of bin colours or a more consistent approach, I think that um, there is opportunities. Um, a cynic might look at this and think uh, the question 
uh, being answered as a result of this approach, not just, uh, certainly not by the Minister, but certainly by a series of, of previous Ministers and Cabinet Secretaries, is how do we ensure that recycling flat lines for as long as possible in Scotland this is another example in a long list of examples of, of how um, Scotland does that. And if that's the policy outcome that the Scottish Government want, happy to. Does, does the member share my frustration that we've obviously, as he's mentioned, we've flatlined in terms of recycling. We're putting forward suggestions about how we improve recycling. There were suggestions put forward last week about targets for recycling, and they're all being rejected by the government. And does he just feel the same as me, that we're just going to be in the exact same place in the next 10 years? Yeah, and I think it's, it's actually really embarrassing that the committee thinks that meeting a recycling target 12 years late is too onerous. I mean, I think... Um, if we're in a climate emergency, then we should be acting quickly. Quite the opposite is what's been proposed and consistently voted upon by this committee on a series of, of measures. Um, I don't intend to move 57, but I think there is there's more work to be done in terms of the possibilities around this. And uh, in broad terms, uh, in terms of segregating your or waste by, via householder and indeed commercial industrial. Given the infrastructure reprocessing um, requirements, many of which, incineration being one example, are around for 25 years, then actually it's that reprocessing capacity that future proofs what we put in as householders into our, our bins, because that without some major, major public funds, that is locked in, rightly or wrongly, uh, and therefore it's actually already future-proofed, and therefore you could get standardisation across a whole host of uh, local authorities, and you could increase your recycling rates really quickly, really easily, if anyone actually wanted to do so. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Did Amendment you would convenient. like to press your amendment 46. Thank you. The question is that amendment 46 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There's five votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 105 in the name of Sarah Boyer already debated with Amendment 46, Maurice Lennon to move or not move. I'm oh, sorry. Did you call me Maurice Lennon? I no. did. <laughs> I, I don't know what's happening. I need more lunch. I need more food. Monica, I apologise profusely, and I apologise profusely to you. I'm uh, trying to go too moved, quickly. Monica moved. Lennon, thank you. Move the <laughs> amendment. And thank you both for your understanding and for giving me. The question is that Amendment 105 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for. There are four votes against. Therefore, it is not agreed. I call Amendment 107 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 106. Uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? They're moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 107 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. Thank you. There are two votes for. There are five votes against. Uh, I call Amendment 47 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendment 47 are and 48 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I therefore call Amendment 48 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 48 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 49 in the, in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendments 49 and 50 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The amendment is not moved. <clears throat> I call Amendment 50 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is, is that Amendment 50 be agreed? Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 108 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 106. Uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 108 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Uh, those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 51 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendments 51 and 52 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. The question is, therefore, Amendment 52 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There are five votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 53 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendments 53 and 54 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Not moved. I therefore call Amendment 54 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 54 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. Now this seems to be a good point, approximately an hour and a half since the last break, to take a five minute break before we move into the next section. Hopefully by that time I will have got my name sorted out in my head and I apologise to members who I confused uh, before by confusing myself. So there will be a five minute suspension. Thank you.
move straight back into this session. Uh, the uh, situation is, just so members are aware, is that we're going to push on for as long as we can this morning to see how far we get. But I know an application was made to the Bureau uh, to extend the deadline for the Stage 2 debate to allow us to debate next week if we need to. I know the Bureau uh, have approved that, but it will be up to Parliament to uh, agree it. So I'm going to do everything in my power to keep things moving. And uh, I would uh, appreciate uh, any support uh, committee members and the minister can give me uh, without stifling debate, uh, which is important. So I'm now going to call a member 55 in the name of Maurice Golden Group with amendments 160 and, one, uh, and 56. Maurice Golden, can you move amendment 55 and speak to all the amendments in the group, please? Thanks, convener. I'd like to move amendment 55, a uh, very small group. Uh, 55 means the ministers must, must rather than may, so must issue guidance on operation of household duty of care. It appears as if the Scottish Government are supportive of that. And uh, 56 um, means that uh, fines can only come into play after the guidance is published. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you very much. I call Jackie Dunbar to speak to Amendment 160 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Convener. I have lodged Amendment 160 in response to recommendations made in the Committee Stage 1 report. This amendment aims to ensure that Scottish Ministers are required to consult with local authorities in their role as waste collection authorities during the preparation of any guidance in relation to the new fixed penalty and civil penalty regime for the enforcement of household waste requirements. Local authorities will be responsible for delivering the enforcement action enabled by these new powers and their input will be critical to ensuring that guidance is practical and effective. Guaranteeing that local government is consulted ensures this valuable perspective is captured and reflected. And I urge the committee to support the amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, looking to see if any other member wants to contribute. Monica Lennon. To get on the record, I think um, 55 and 56 are both good amendments that will strengthen this part of the bill, both by requiring the payment to be made and guidance to be published before the section comes into force. I think these are welcome improvements to this section, and 160 by Jackie Dunbar, I think, is also a good amendment. And again, it, it speaks to that, that whole set of work around co design um, with relevant authorities, and again, that is crucial to the bill's success. So, um, these are good proposals. Thank you very much, Monica. Just looking around the room to see if anyone else knows. Uh, Minister. In the spirit of getting us over the fin finish line, I won't go over the reasons why uh, I am necessarily supporting Amendment 55, but I am supporting it. And, uh, um, and uh, Jackie Dunbar's Amendment 160. I'm also supporting that. Um, Amendment 56, though, um, I just want to say in response to, to Mr Golden that I, I, I can't support an attempt to restrict, um, the, again, the, 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 the consultation with local authorities. Um, the guidance on approach to enforcement will be created in consultation with local authorities and ensure that enforcement offers have comprehensive and practical guidance on the application of these provisions, including the steps that must be taken in relation to any enforcement actions as I've already mentioned. So I won't be able to support that as it stands at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Maurice Golden, to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 55, please, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Convener. After, I think, three sessions and um, almost 15 hours, I might have actually have something that the Scottish Government agree with. I'm, I'm a little bit puzzled as to what's wrong with 55, but nonetheless, I'll take it uh, as supportive and hopefully I haven't made a mistake somewhere along the line. But uh, uh, happy to press it, convener. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, Amendment 55 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, I call Amendment 160 in the name of Jackie Dunbar, already debated with Amendment 55. Jackie Dunbar, to move or not move? Move. The question is, Amendment 160 be agreed? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, I therefore call Amendment 56 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 55. Maurice Golden, to move or not move? Not moved. Yeah, not moved. Uh, therefore, call Amendment... <coughs> 
57 in the name of Morris Golden, already debated with Amendment 46. Morris Golden to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 118 in the name of Edward Mountain, already debated with Amendment 46. Uh, and I'm asked to move or not move. I am not moving that amendment. The amendment is not moved. The question is that Section 11 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. So I'm now going to call Amendment 161 in the name of Morris Golden, grouped with Amendments 89, 162, 217, 218, 58, 59 and 163. Morris Golden to move Amendment 161 and speak to the amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'd like to move 161, which adds reuse and repair to the Code of Practice on Household Waste Recycling. I think, quite rightly, recycling is considered um, and is all, a lot of the time a focus of our attention, but uh, recognising uh, the waste hierarchy, actually prevention, preparation for reuse and associated activities are, are just as uh, are not just as important, actually more important um, in terms of our ambitions. And therefore, I have uh, 161 and 162 to recognise that. Uh, I think there's more we can do in this space, but that's a starter for 10. Um, 58 um, references the Code of Practice, which must be prepared and published by the end of 2025. Again, really easy to, to put in place. Um, um, you know, uh, very uh, simple um, uh, date there. And uh, 59 is around uh, uh, sufficient funds for local authority. And 163 is around consultation with the general public. As we know, public participation is a key environmental uh, objective. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, thank you very much. I call Doug Douglas Lumsden to speak to Amendment 89 and other amendments in the group. Douglas. Yeah, just briefly on um, 89, I think what we heard as a committee from taking evidence that some local authorities were going to be um, fairly different in terms of recycling than others. I'm thinking some of the, the island communities, um, for example. So this, this is just to give um, some flexibility to note that some local authorities may be qu quite significantly different um, than others. Thank you very much, uh, Douglas. Bob Doris, can you now speak to Amendment 217 and any other amendments in the group? Bob. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, at the outset, can I say I'd, I'd lodge this initially as a as <coughs> program amendments and sorry Minister, I'm not trying to discuss this with you in any detail, but I'll say that a little bit more at the end of, of my contribution, Convener. Uh, so Section 12 in the Code of Practice for Household Waste um, is aimed at getting you know, greater consistency and greater coordination across local authorities. We had much of a debate already in relation to that. Uh, and, and what is in that Code of Practice may be, on the face of the bill, but it says may be, is receptacles used for collection, frequency of collection, items for recycling, composting, management of contamination of household waste, and communication with public on collections and recycling. What's not contained within it, from what I can see anyway, is the relationship with any potential strategy with bulk uplift items or garden waste items, which 217 and 218 amendments uh, refer to respectively. Um, now, I believe that is an omission, uh, and my amendments would not uh, compel uh, local authorities or the strategy indeed to contain provisions for that, but, by, but may uh, have it within the strategy. I would think they would hope to look at it during that co-production process that the Minister has, has, been, has been speaking about. An intervention on that? Yes, of course. So, um, I, I thank Mr Doris for taking the intervention. So just so I'm, I'm clear in my mind, so this doesn't compel, because I know in terms of garden waste, for example, some local authorities ex pick it up and some don't. So this is not really compelling the ones that are not picking it up to start picking it up. Is that correct? Uh, Mr Roman Lumsden is, is absolutely right. And I will say a little bit more about, about that later. I should note that everything else I listed that the government is suggesting could be within that strategy is not compulsion either. It may be included. And likewise, bulk uplift and uh, garden waste may be included, but there's no compulsion in relation to that, and that's 217 and 218. As I said, I believe that that is, is an omission. 
uh, I think that ideally it would be in a, a code of practice that would empower a, a action in this area if considered appropriate. But to, to be fair, I believe relatively strongly in an ideal world it would be within any a, a code of practice. I'm increasingly concerned of small scale, often everyday fly tipping in urban areas, Glasgow in particular, where I represent Maryhill and Springburn, but having spoken to colleagues in the Parliament, I know there's a wider issue in, in relation to that. Some of it being uh, unintended fly tipping, where people put mattresses, couches, fridges, other items out, where maybe five years ago, ten years ago, was the collection point for bulk uplift that no longer exists within a local authority area. So some of it, I have to acknowledge, is unintentional. Um, and I do believe that charges are an issue here. So whilst there is no statutory duty for local authorities to offer bulk uplifts or indeed uh, garden waste provision, by definition they have strategies on it already. They have strategies on it. Of course, though, that's why 31 or 32 local authorities do charge for bulk uplift. Fife is the only local authority that doesn't. And of those 31 local authorities, two have an annual fee, so you pay your fee, you get a bulk uplift over the course of the year, but the rest have a variety of um, methods. Some are per item and some are for bundles of items. So Glasgow City Council, Edinburgh City Council and, and, and East Lothian Council, for example, will charge you a household £5 per item for bulk uplift. But bundled charges would include East Redfordshire, where up to five items is £40, up to ten items is £50. And it varies across the country. For example, Inverclyde and Aberdeenshire have very similar models to East Redfordshire. So there's a patchwork of provision. Uh, now, I should point out that seven councils have reductions or exemptions uh, for low-income households or households that are local authority tenants, but most do not. Now, can, can I just say bluntly that I think if someone is in a flat, they have no garden, they have no car, they're on a low income and there's charges in place, if it's a carpet or if it's a sofa or a mattress or a fridge or whatever, that maybe that household has struggled to actually purchase in the first place, there's a strong chance, I would hope not, but there's always a chance that occasional fly tipping may happen as a result of that. And there will be a relationship between the charging regimes in each local authority area and the pattern that we see across the country in relation to fly tipping. Now, we've already heard of issues over uh, fly tipping data. There's not enough data in relation to it more generally. This will be another occasion where we don't have enough information in relation to this. But earlier on, we also held a householder duty of care to make sure that when, the, and I think the expression was used, man with a van, well, person with a van, that you can try to, to discard your bulk uplift items. They're effect, we're putting duty of cares on that, but they're effectively competitors with the local authority in each instance who also offer a similar service. So there's a direct connection, again, in relation to local authority strategies. So I, I think we need greater consistency in this area. Uh, we, need, we need to look at the relationship between local authorities in bulk uplift, but also garden waste, which would point out that uh, six offer no service whatsoever. So six local authorities, there is no garden waste service, and seven offer it for free. So again, a patchwork of provision across the country. Now, I don't suggest by having this within uh, the code of practice, or to be considered a code of practice, it would change all that. I merely ask the co-production model to look at these issues as a matter of course, as, as they decide what should be in that uh, code of practice. So um, I started off by saying this was a probing amendment. It remains a probing amendment. But what I would say is the more I've heard of the debate, the more I'm compelled to say this must be resolved somehow. And if not in this amendment, I would certainly welcome further conversation with the Minister. Uh, I was about to conclude, but OK, Mr Lumsden. I, I'm just trying to think, you know, it, it has may. Do you not think it would have been better to actually compel local authorities to, to do something about garden waste and also um, bulk uplift? At first, I don't agree with that, Mr Lumsden. It's a really helpful intervention because... Uh, this is not about placing further statutory obligations onto local authorities, absolutely not. And the other areas that the Code of Practice will include, the language used within the, the face of the bill says may and not must also. So that would give it an undue status compared to the other areas that will be within the, the Code of Practice. I wouldn't agree with that, but I, I think there's maybe a, 
we're a meeting of minds in terms of resolving some of the issues that, that, that I've outlined. Uh, these amendments may not be the way to resolve those issues, but I think it does have to be discussed by Parliament. I did raise it during the Stage 1 evidence session, though Mr McPherson also had a concern in relation to some of this were Deputy Convener. So, uh, I'm happy to keep this as a probing amendment, but I would like some further discussions with the Minister ahead of Stage 3 to see if there's a more pro appropriate way I can get the assurances to make sure we can tease out that relationship between charging regimes and that mixed uh, approach across 32 local authorities and the strategy that will be produced by uh, co-production. I'll leave it at that. Thank, thank you very much. I'm looking to see if any other... Uh, yes, Ma Mark. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I mean, the focus of this bill is on co-production with local authorities. You know, I recognise that. We just had a number of debates around targets and, you know, putting more certainty onto the face of the bill. I, I do believe, though, that the best way forward and the best way to actually drive up recycling rates is to really, really double down on areas like the code of practice and to really get local authorities working together. Um, to try and you know, deliver that sort of uniformity where, where it makes sense to deliver that. Um, so like, I am sympathetic to 161. I am sympathetic to what Morris Golden is looking to insert as an amendment into the bill here, and I was kind of thinking along the same lines myself. However, like, I, I am interested to hear the Minister's response to that. You know, there is a need to really ensure that there are proper facilities for reuse and repair, not just in one local authority, not just in a handful of exemplar local authorities, but across the whole of Scotland. And I think embedding that into this bill is really, really important. Um, so I'm interested to hear the Minister's response to that. And if it can't be supported today, how that could be taken forward um, for stage three. And I think likewise, the... Um, you know, the, the, the need to get on with the code of practice. You know, Morris Golden introduces a date here at the end of 2025. I, I, I don't know if that will be welcomed by local authorities or, or, or not, but, you know, we, we need to have clarity as to what that date is um, and, and the progress towards, towards meeting that code of practice. In terms of um, Bob's amendments, I'm, I'm kind of less clear on this, to be honest, because I think there are some quite big choices for local authorities in this space. And I speak as a, as a former councillor some time ago now, um, before I entered Parliament pre-2016. But, you know, the, the, the decision about whether to really invest in a household garden waste service, I think, is a difficult one. I don't think it's always the best environmental option uh, to be, you know, driving around big trucks, you know, effectively picking up garden waste. But, you know, there are choices that the councils need to make there. Um, and also with household bulk uplift services, how councils actually configure that in a way that is just as well, I think, are important choices. So to what extent all of that can be codified uh, in a code of practice, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. And I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that consistency is, is always the best approach with those. Yes, certainly, Bob. I, I, I thank Matt Ruskell for, for giving way. And the member may, in fact, be right that... Certainly, it's less, less clear, I think, with garden waste, and I would accept that, which I've separated into two separate amendments. But for domestic bulk uplift waste, I think it would be desirable. I could, of course, be wrong. But this amendment would just ask the co-production model to consider and not to compel. Uh, and I think, given I think the testimony what we've heard from witnesses and our we're, own we're caseloads across Scotland, that occasional fly tipping from uh, domestic waste and that potential relationship with charging regimes and what services offered at local authority level is very real. So would Mr Ruskell think it would be no bad thing for that co-production model to at least consider uh, bulk uplift regimes uh, across 32 local authorities? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, the member makes, makes a good case. I mean, I don't know to what extent that is already under discussion, whether that's a desire within local authorities and COSLA to move towards something that is, that is more uh, consistent and unified across Scotland, or, you know, if there are cases for, for local authorities to be taking slightly different approaches. I'm, I'm not aware of the detail on that. I'll certainly listen to, um, to what the Minister says on that, and I, and I would hope that there'll be more discussion ahead of stage three as to if there is some uncertainty about whether that's being treated seriously, the options being treated seriously within the development of code of practice, then it then might be appropriate to put something into legislation. But I sense what we've got in, in this set of amendments, and indeed over the last couple of days of considering amendments, is calls from members of this committee and outside this committee for more certainty as to how things are being developed, what the state of play is, 
uh, amongst uh, those who are involved in that co-production and, and what kind of assurances we can have that certain key things like reuse and repair are not going to get dropped just because you know they're not in the legislation so I think that that's where the frustration and the sort of residual concern is coming certainly from me and from a number of members of this committee that's it uh, just looking round, there doesn't appear to be anyone else. So I'll move to the minister. Yeah, I think in general it's, it's a balance, isn't it, um, between um, you know things on the, on the face of the bill compelling and actually trusting and enabling a co-design process in which the people who are actually going to have to deliver on the ground um, better recycling rates are actually actively involved. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's what I'm striving to do. That's what my predecessors tried to do. And I think that's what the committee actually really recommended that we do as well. Um, I'll, I'll talk about um, amendments 161 and 162. We used to repair of course, are absolutely uh, important to receive, uh, achieving a circular economy, and there's not enough of it going on, frankly. And I think that's been a, a, a common theme over the last three weeks, um, as well as in stage one as well. The, the bill already does make provision for the code to address preparation for reuse as well. Um, I envisage that the development of the new code alongside this wider work through the, the route map will enable further consideration of how we maximise local authorities' contribution across and further up the waste hierarchy, including uh, reuse and repair. And I think that there's a number of members who have been making that point throughout the whole process. As it's written, um, I mean, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for the new code to provide mandatory requirements in relation to provision of wider reuse or repair services, um, as these don't fall in if within local authority statutory waste management functions. And that's the reason why I can't support the amendments as, as, as written. And I hope Mr Golden uh, understands that, that. The committee should note that in the current voluntary code of practice, there is guidance on desirable reuse activities uh, approaches, communication that local authorities should consider in their ways of working. And I'd be keen to build upon that approach through the planned co-design of the new code uh, to explore the opportunities and how to enhance local authority activities to promote reuse and repair on a voluntary or recommended uh, basis, even if they don't become statutory. And of course, um, uh, we are obviously currently developing the improvement programme um, as an alternative to financial penalties for local authority recycling tariffs, and that could offer a more practical route to share best practice on waste prevention measures, uh, which I think is the, the, the first line in, in uh, a circular economy, is prevention of waste in the first place. Um, so I, I won't be able to support th those amendments for those reasons. 89, I'll just say that I, I think it's very much in the spirit of Verity House. Now we have that local flexibility. We're supporting that amendment, Mr Lumsden. Um, I urge the committee to support it as well. Um, amendment 58, I understand the desire to ensure that the new code of practice is available as soon as possible, but I can't support the amendment because I don't want to set a statutory deadline that could potentially prevent meaningful co-design and consultation on the new code. Again, it comes back to that balance. Yes. Thanks. Um, just wondering when the Minister thinks that it will be produced. 25, End of March 26 is the target. End of March 26 is the indicative date. And thank you, my official, for stepping in there because I didn't have it to the front of my brain. Um, so it is a priority action for the Scottish Government um, to continue progress at place. I'm very happy to keep uh, the committee in informed there. I just, I, I think that, again, I want to say that prioritising measures which uh, prevent waste is a real opportunity for this co-design process as well. Amendment 59... Uh, I recognise that there's limitations on resources of local authorities. We've had previous amendments that I haven't been able to put in the face of the bill uh, anything about um, you know, uh, the funding associated with local authorities. The new code will be agreed with local government who are best placed to indicate if they're sufficiently funded for the measures that they've jointly agreed. And then, of course, that's fed into the annual budget process. So I can't support this amendment. Uh, Bob, Bob Doris, uh, amendments 217-218, uh, raising the important issue of, of bulky waste and garden waste. I understand the intention. I'm happy to work with the member on what we can do there. I won't be able to support them 
as, as they stand. I just want to say a consultation on the graph, draft circular economy and waste route map uh, set our intention to undertake a review of waste and recycling service charging by next year. And we intend to conduct this review to ensure that we've got the right incentives to reduce waste. I think Mr Doris made some really important points about those on lower, lower incomes that don't have access to a vehicle don't have a garden, um, what do they do? Again, I point to some of the initiatives that are happening in the, the, the private company space, where a lot of, a lot of these, um, we should encourage more to do so, where the, 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 the vendors of, for example, uh, electrical items have a, a sort of like a, an uplift service for the, the, the items that are being replaced. Uh, so I think that's, that's always to be welcomed and encouraged. Um, the bill, as drafted, already enables uh, bulky and garden waste services to be considered and included in the new code of practice. Um, and I, I would say that we need to work with local authorities to decide and put place arrangements that increase recycling and reuse, but ref reflect local circumstances. And I think Mr Doris made that point. I do agree with the Minister about local circumstances, and I'm pleased that we can have further discussions ahead of stage three. But the Minister also said that uh, the code, the bill is, is drafted just now, does not preclude that from being within the code technically. Is that because there's nothing in the bill that says what is not allowed to be in the code? So theoretically, anything could be in the code? It, indeed, and the, the code is going to be co-designed right. uh, by those that are going to, effectively, a lot of them are going to have to be delivering on, on this. Um, but they are obviously going to have to meet statutory targets as well. So that code is going to have to be robust. Um, so um, regarding, uh, regarding 163, the bill already provides that Scottish ministers must consult publicly on the draft code of practice, so that I, I don't think that that amendment is, is necessary. Convener, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to call on Maurice Golden to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 161. Maurice. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think and this is no reflection on the minister who's been in post for a very short time. I think trusting to deliver is a, is a, is a theme in this area of which there's very little trust based on um, the Scottish Government consistently setting targets which they make no attempt to meet. And it'll be very interesting to see next year if the food waste target, the one third reduction by 2025 is met, which I agree with the minister is the first line of the waste hierarchy. Um, I do have concerns around March 26, because as members will be aware, um, a short delay to that, and then there might only be a few of us um, who are there to then pick that up in another session, although I wish everyone well in that <laughs> election. Um, uh, and, and that is a, a genuine concern, and a genuine concern around, the, the again, no reflection on the, the Minister over the, the multiple delays to this bill, but we are where we are. Um, I, happy to. Yeah. I, I agree that we need to go far, faster and harder in terms of improving our recycling rates. But does Mr Golden agree that it is a matter of fact that our recycling rates at the moment are the best they've been since records began? The 62.3% recycling rate isn't as good as we want it to be, but it is certainly the highest that it has been. So we're two different things, Minister. Um, I think what you're speaking about is the overall recycling rate, which I think is... Um, again, the, the target is uh, 70 per cent, and I think there's uh, an opportunity to actually meet that, and that's, that's certainly to be welcomed. I think when we're looking at really the focus of discussions around here, rightly or wrongly, is around household recycling rates, and clearly that's quite different in terms of most of our discussions have been around, around that, uh, and they're quite separate discussions. I think when you st start talking about an overall recycling rate, you're bringing in commercial and industrial, you might be looking at uh, special waste, and then we're down a whole different track, actually a track that I would welcome. Um, and separately, you've got household waste, where we are flatlining, where there's some very simple measures that can be put in place to improve it. And that's been the general theme. And actually, in terms of uh, these sets of amendments, that's where the, the focus is uh, for the moment. I think there's room for both, 
but contextually, when we're talking about recycling, whether it's overall recycling rates or household recycling rates, this is the first rung on the ladder of net zero. And actually, we need to quickly bank those hopeful successes and move on to some really difficult, if you think this has been difficult, I would suggest that the future conversations around net zero will be even more challenging around transport, sustainable consumption, um, heating our homes. And, and that's where I'd like us to be now, but we're not there. We've still got some of the early work to do. Um, but as I said earlier, that's uh, no reflection on the current minister. Um, I would just like to press 161, please. Convener. Thank you very much, Mr. Golden. The question is, Amendment 161 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 89 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, already debated with... <coughs> sorry. Amendment 161, Douglas Lumsden to move or not moved? Moved. The question is, Amendment 89 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 162 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 161. Maurice Golden to move or not moved? Moved. The question is, Amendment 162 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 217 in the name of Bob Doris, already debated with amendment 161. Bob Doris to move or not move? Not move, give you that. The amendment is not moved. I call Amendment 218 in the name of Bob Doris, already debated with Amendment 161. Bob Doris to move or not move? Moved. Not moved. The question, sorry, I call Amendment 58 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 161. Maurice Golden to move or not moved? Moved. And the question is that Amendment 58 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those, ag those against, please raise their hands. Sorry, you've got that wrong. There were three votes for that. Sorry, I'm going to call that again because the clerks recorded that wrong. I want to get that right, please. I uh, call Amendment 58. Uh, sorry, <clears throat> we are not agreed there will be a division. Those in favour of 58, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 59 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 161. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 59 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 109 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 106. Uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? Move. Uh, the question, therefore, is Amendment 109 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. <coughs> There'll be, there were two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 110 in the name of Sue uh, Webber, already debated with Amendment 106. Douglas Lumsden to move or not moved? Uh, moved. Uh, the question is, Amendment 110 be agreed, are we all agreed? And we're not agreed, there'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 111 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with Amendment 106. Uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? move. Uh, the question is, that Amendment 111 be agreed? Are we all agreed? We are not, we are not agreed. Uh, there will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are two votes for, there are five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 163 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with amendment 161. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Not moved. Uh, the amendment is not moved. So I, the question is at this stage that section 12 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. <clears throat> I call Amendment 205 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with Amendment 15. Monica Lennon to move or not move? Moved. The, the question is that Amendment 205 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 164. In the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 15. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 164 be agreed? Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call an Amendment 60 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 15. Maurice Golden to move or not moved? Moved. The question is, Amendment 60 be agreed? Are we all agreed? Sorry, I'm going to say that again. No. OK, the, we are not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are... There are three votes for, there are four votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 90 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, already debated with Amendment 15. Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? Moved. The question is, Amendment 90 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 165 in the name of Lorna Slater, already debated with Amendment 15. Uh, Minister, can you move it formally, please? Uh, the question is that Amendment 165 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 166 in the name of Lorna Slater, already debated with Amendment 15. Minister, can you move it formally, please? Moved. The question is that Amendment 166 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call an Amendment 167 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 15. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Move. <clears throat> the question is that Amendment 167 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against, therefore the amendment is not agreed. Can I call amendment 112 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with amendment 106. Douglas Lumsden, to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is that amendment 112 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No, we're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 113 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with amendment 106. Uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not move? Moved. The question is, amendment 113 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there'll be, there are five votes against, the amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 114 in the name of Sue Webber, already debated with amendment 106. Uh, Douglas Lumsden to move or not moved? Moved. The question is that amendment 114 be agreed, are we all agreed? We're not agreed, there'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call amendment 168 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with amendment 15. Maurice Golden to move or not moved? Not moved. Uh, the amendment is not moved. I call amendment 206 in the name of Sarah Boyack, already debated with amendment 15. Monica Lennon to move or not moved? Moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 206 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. 
There are three votes for. There are four votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 61 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendments 61 and 62 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move? Uh, not sorry, moved. to move or not? Not moved. Okay. The question... Uh, sorry, therefore call Amendment 62 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move. Moved. Uh, the question is that Amendment 62 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for. There are five votes against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 63 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. I remind members that Amendments 63 and 64 are direct alternatives. Graham Simpson to move or not move. Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I call Amendment 64 in the name of Graham Simpson, already debated with Amendment 5. Graham Simpson to move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 64 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are two votes for, there are five votes against, the amendment is not agreed. I call the amendment 91 in the name of Douglas Lumsden, already debated with amendment 15. Douglas Lumsden to move. Move. Uh, the question is that amendment 91 be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for, there are four votes against. The amendment is not agreed. The question is section 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? I, think I call amendment 65 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with amendment 46. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Not moved. The amendment is not moved. I'm now going to move on and call amendment 66 in the name of Maurice Golden, group with amendment 67. Maurice Golden to move amendment 66 and speak to both amendments in the group. Maurice. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I'd like to move amendment 66, which seeks to prevent, uh, protect frontline waste operatives via guidance uh, from assaults. Um, I think. Um, both these amendments are a result of what could be changes to terms and conditions for uh, waste operatives um, um, throughout uh, Scotland and therefore um, with any changes as a result of uh, bin finds or, or contamination inspections then what I would like to see is that the uh, ministers must get approval from trade unions and local authorities uh, before implementing legislation to get waste operatives to inspect bins. C clearly, our, our frontline staff are out there, um, uh, and under t current terms and conditions, there may be requirements on occasion, depending on the local authority, to engage in certain practices, but it would appear and on the basis of our discussions earlier today, that there could be a significant change to work practices um, as a result of this bill. And therefore, I think um, it's uh, important that um, conditions in terms of workplace uh, safety and working conditions are um, uh, to the fore when considering um, this legislation. And that's what these amendments are about. Happy to. Yeah, it's just a, a question about whether, if um, you know, Scottish ministers issued guidance, whether that would cut across any collective bargaining that the unions might put in place with 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 COSLA on these issues in relation to terms and conditions. It's just a genuine question around that. Well, I, I would hope it wouldn't, but um, because actually, this is these amendments about standing up for trade unions and and the workers that they represent and ultimately it strikes me that this legislation could result in changes to terms and conditions and uh, therefore um, uh, I'd be quite happy to work with the committee or the government to make any wording changes but that is the ultimate uh, intention of uh, these amendments. Happy to Monica. 
I'm no, grateful to Maurice Golden for bringing these amendments forward. Um, you know, it's really important we've got a zero tolerance culture around violence against any worker, but I think sometimes people working in, in, in waste disposal um, are getting abused that many of us don't actually realise that it, it goes on and safety is obviously crucial. Um, I would just be interested to know what discussions the member has had with the relevant trade unions. Um, and I'll, I'll put again on the record my membership of um, Unite and the GMB, who represent workers in this sector, as do Unison and I chair the Scottish Labour trade union group in this parliament. So I just wonder, has Maurice Gold been able to have discussions with um, either the STUC or individual unions about the way that the, the amendments have been drafted? So I think maybe just a few questions on language, but I do agree with the, the sentiments. No, I haven't, but I would be happy to. Um, obviously, there will be frontline workers who are not represented by trade unions as well. But um, being the grandson of a frontline waste operative, or, or bin man, as uh, I, I called him, um, I, I understand the practical realities that some of this le legislation could change in terms of, well, it, it might sound small, if you're looking to build this evidence case, which must be very strong, then you could be asking those um, frontline operatives to, to check bins beyond a cursory glance. That could lead to um, confrontational uh, aspects. There might actually be training provisions that's required beyond what is normally expected of um, our, our frontline waste operatives. Uh, so there's actually a whole host of areas that one um, seemingly small change could actually lead to some um, drastic changes in skills required, terms and conditions, maybe not in every local authority area, but maybe in certain uh, areas, maybe for certain uh, parts of the workforce. And really what I'm trying to flush out on this is any unintended consequences of an additional policy um, uh, interaction from this place. And, and I think that's what we need to achieve. Yeah. I'm sorry for, for, for adding on, on, on to this. And I'm sorry if this what you answered to Mark Ruskell, but just for clarity in my head, uh, th does Maurice Golden have any example of where anything in this legislation will cut across long-standing processes in relation to terms and conditions for trade unions and the trade union movement? Is it a genuine question? I, I can't see it within the legislation, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to Well, if, if you consider bin fines, and actually from the evidence we've heard today, there's going to be quite a high level of evidence required in terms of building that. So what may happen, and again, it varies from local authorities, in terms of identifying contamination at this moment in time, um, some frontline operatives might be asked to have a cursory glance at the top of the bin. And therefore, the only way you'll get contamination or identify it is if it's in the top. Um, if you're looking as, you know, to ensure a full audit of a bin, which we don't know because we haven't seen the guidance attached to that, there might be um, further evidence required deeper down in, into the bin. And that could lead to a whole host of unintended consequences. That could be a drastic change in terms of uh, new practices that are required. Perhaps they, if they notice um, contamination in the top, they're required to look throughout the bin to establish if that was a mistake or whether it's part of a pattern of behaviour. So you can see quickly how the establishing of uh, a bin find suddenly changes quite drastically some work practices. And uh, therefore, I think it needs to be fully considered before it is put in place. Back to you, convener. Thank you. Um, I'm looking around to see if any other members want to contribute. If not, I'm going to move to you, Minister. Thank you, convener. Amendment 66. Um, it would, would require ministers to issue guidance to waste collection authorities on how to respond to assaults as we've heard. And, and I understand the motivation for this uh, amendment. But assault is already an offence, a uh, very serious matter, and, and, and you would expect that it would be reported to the police. However, uh, statutory guidance issued by the Scottish Government in this area could potentially contradict or otherwise interfere with the duties of Lord Advocate. 
as head of the Criminal Prosecution Service, and that's the reason I can't support this. I just want to pick up on some of the, the, the points. The, the current uh, voluntary code of practice includes sections on workforce development, operational delivery, set out measures to involve staff members in the planning and preparation for service delivery, and ensuring that staff are properly equipped for the tasks necessary, and that would include training as, as, as part of that. And I would expect local authorities continue to uphold these standards, given the importance of the issue. I just want to point as well um, to how seriously we we've take, take uh, the, the, the issue of any violence against wage, uh, uh, waste staff. In 2022, we provided grant funding to the Scottish Waste Industry Training Competency Health and Safety Forum called Switch Forum to support a campaign against violence and aggression towards the recycling industry staff as well. We take that very seriously. But Mark Ruskell, um, I mean, I, 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 I acknowledge uh, in, in, in this, uh, 67 that the importance of working with employee representatives on safe working conditions and workforce development for waste workers. And then councils have um, very serious uh, responsibilities as employers. But Mark Ruskell and Bob Doris make a very important point about the relationship that already exists between trade unions uh, and local authorities. And I wouldn't want to do anything to, to uh, jeopardise that. Uh, there is another point, though, I just want to make. I'll take Ms Lennon in a second. A, a serious constitutional point that industrial relations as well as employment law and health and safety law are all reserved matters. Uh, if we impose a duty on ministers relating to these reserved matters, um, this amendment would be out with the legislative competence of the Parliament. And I don't think that that's what Mr Golden intends with this. It's a well-meant amendment, but it would jeopardise the uh, implementation of the entire bill if agreed. For that reason, I'll take Ms Lennon. Um, thank you, Minister. I mean, again, I think there's some really important points and principles being raised here, and you know, I appreciate there's other work streams outside this committee's remit in terms of um, Scotland's aspiration to be a fair work nation by 2025. Recently, senior figures in the trade union movement in Scotland have cast a lot of doubt on that, whether we're on track. Um, but given <coughs> some of the obligations that Morris Golden's narrated, and we're going to have you know, workers potentially in situations that could become quite confrontational. Um, clearly, there needs to be that guidance and co-design work around that. Is there um, a possibility for this to be taken away? I mean, I would encourage Morris Golden to speak to relevant unions and the STUC, but we do have legislation around the protection of retail workers, yeah. which was passed by this parliament. So I wonder with that in mind is perhaps a template notwithstanding issues around employment law matters that are reserved, could we look at that legislation to see if there's any learnings that can be taken from that? Because I think Maurice Golden has a really good intent with his amendments, but some of the wording maybe needs to be looked at and just how we frame this. So is that something the Minister could take away to speak to? I mean, I'm happy to look at that. Well? I'm, I'm always very wary of putting in legislation that oh, does something that already is against the law. You know, it's already against the law to, to assault somebody, regardless of where they work. Um, I think that the, the Code of Practice and the review of the Code of Practice and the new Code of Practice can take into account whether or not employees uh, have the, the correct training and empowerment and, and knowledge of how to deal with the situation. I think it's in making an important point, Ms Lennon, about Mr Gold might want to work with the unions ahead something that, that is workable. Um, but it has to be it has to be competent um, and not impinge on uh, reserve matters. That's uh, we, we butt up against this all the time in this parliament. You know my views on the fact that I believe that we should have employment law in, in this place to be decided because I think that it's something that comes up from all parties around our, how our, our hands are tied in this area time and time again regardless of, of Bill. Yes. It's, it's just back to the point that Monica Lennon made. So if there was, a, if there was something put in place for retail workers, why couldn't there be something? Why is it suddenly a, a constitutional matter when we're looking at waste operatives? Industrial relations, employment law and health and safety law are reserved, and that's just a fact, uh, uh, Mr Lumsden. You know? So, you know, I, again, I come back to this, this thing. If something is already illegal, assault is already illegal, 
uh, and also it was Daniel Johnson that put in place uh, particular sort of aggravating, I think it was aggravating factors, but I can't really remember because it was in the, I think it was in the last session of Parliament and that seems like an awful long time ago. I'm happy to, to reflect on, on what's here, but as it stands, Mr Golden's amendment is impossible for me to support for the reasons that I've stated. You finished? Or yes. You had finished. Um, I'm sorry, it's the Minister's call, not mine. Uh, so, Maurice Golden, can I ask you to wind up and press a withdraw amendment 66, please? And thank you, uh, convener. I mean, I, th I think 67 doesn't seek to change any reserved law. It just recognised that uh, changes to um, the employer or ch changes from the employee, which could be the local authority, to the um, uh, it, it needs to be recognised. And this is a result of Scottish government policy to change ultimately the terms and conditions of the frontline operatives. And that's the key point here. It's not the um, local authority seeking to do that it is the Scottish uh, government seeking to change uh, terms and conditions. So it's within the scope of what the Scottish government have defined that I have suggested that trade unions should be involved in uh, that said scope. So this isn't a, anything to do with Westminster. And if it is, then the Scottish government should remove all their amendments in relation to bin fines. I'm just commenting on the pitch in which they have decided to play on. And, and with that, I would like to not move 66. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'm sorry, you know that he, it, it's up to Mr. Golden if he wants to take an intervention. Um, do you... Thanks, convener. Okay, so the, the members, uh, Maurice Golden's uh, wishes to withdraw Amendment 66. Does anyone object? No one objects. Uh, so I now call Amendment 67 in the name of Maurice Golden, already debated with Amendment 66. Maurice Golden to move or not move? Moved. Uh, the question is, Amendment 67 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please raise their hands. Those against, please raise their hands. There are three votes for and there are four votes against. Therefore, the amendment is not agreed. Now, very sadly, uh, we are going to call a stop there. Just as I got to my moment in the sun when we were going to talk about littering from vehicles and civil penalties. Something to look forward to, to next week. Can I thank members uh, and particularly the minister and, and the committee members uh, for their five hours worth of, of debate that we've had this morning. Quite a marathon session, and I think the only person to mangle any of their speeches was me when I got to people's names, so I apologise for that again. Next week, uh, we are going to be uh, starting at 8.45 with a pre-beef for committee members, um, which will mean that um, <clears throat> we'll start the meeting on stage two amendments, could I just ask you, just, I'm wrapping up very quickly, Mr Golden, is, is we'll start on the meeting for stage two amendments at nine o'clock. And once we finish that, we've got an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy. We'll be considering our annual report. Um, and could I also just remind members, uh, very importantly, uh, there is a SPICE seminar tomorrow morning with the Climate Change Committee uh, leading a discussion on carbon budgeting, which I'm sure everyone will find very interesting. And, and yeah, I've done it. Uh, so, what have I not done? Yes, and on that note, I close the meeting. I was getting to it. The clerks want to go quicker than me. Thank you very much, and I've closed the meeting.